Uh, today, our committee will consider the fiscal year 2025 appropriation bills recommended by the Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies, the Subcommittee on Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies, the Subcommittee on Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development and Related Agencies, the Subcommittee on State Foreign Operations and Related Programs is on our calendar for today. We're working through a couple of last minute issues. We should be able to move to that, but uh, we will, just for everybody's awareness, we're still working through a few, few issues on that. Um, so before we get going, let me quickly run through the plan for today, and I will start off with some opening remarks. Next, the Vice Chair will uh, give her opening remarks, and as soon as those remarks have concluded and everyone is here, I intend to begin voting on final passage of the three bills, um, and we will hold again on Subcommittee on State Foreign Operations, which we will do later in, the, in this morning's hearing. We have a number of other committees meeting this morning and a short window to have all of our members here, so I do ask that everyone be here um, in full attendance till we get those votes done. Following those votes, we will move to the consideration of amendments to those bills. Uh, with that, I want to thank Vice Chair Collins, Senator Shaheen and Moran, the Chair and Ranking Member of the CJS Subcommittee, Senators Merkley and Murkowski, the Interior Subcommittee Chair and Ranking Member, Senator Coons and Graham, the SFOP Subcommittee Chair and Ranking Member, and Senator Schatz and Hyde Smith, the T. HUD Subcommittee Chair and Ranking Member, who will have put in hard work to pull together all four strong bipartisan bills. We passed three bills in overwhelming votes last time, thanks to everyone who put politics aside and put solutions first, and we are in a good position to make progress on that today. I have emphasized throughout this process, and really as long as I've been in politics, that we cannot shortchange our families or our communities or our future. So I'm glad this committee is once again working to produce and pass funding bills that will make people's lives better, address challenges that we are facing, and invest in our country's future. And I'm glad, as we discussed at our first markup, that Vice Chair Collins and I were able to reach a bipartisan agreement to make these investments possible with much needed additional funding for non-defense and defense alike. It's crucial to making sure we can address serious shortfalls tackle urgent new challenges here at home and abroad, prevent devastating layoffs and cutbacks to services, and invest in families and in our country's future. Now, the bipartisan bills before us today include funding to support families, and I'm especially pleased they deliver crucial new investments to help address the housing crisis, build more affordable housing, keep families in their homes. They include investments to strengthen our economy and keep America on the cutting edge with funding for everything from groundbreaking scientific research to help make good on the promise of the Chips and the Science Act, to weather satellites that are crucial for so many industries and everyone at home wondering about tomorrow's forecast, to support for NASA's missions and maintaining our incredible legacy of leadership in space, to rebuilding or to building trade relations and trade infrastructure like our ports. And of course, there are countless different ways these bills invest in keeping people safe, with funding to hire and keep air traffic controllers, rail safety inspectors, wildland firefighters, and law enforcement officials. These bills deliver resources to help ensure every American has access to clean air and clean water and to combat the climate crisis and protect our country's incredible lands and waterways. And they deliver crucial investments in diplomacy and strengthening our global leadership, an especially important tool right now, given the aggressive moves we have seen from our adversaries and the allies we have, like Ukraine, facing ex existential threats. Getting here has not been easy. It has required all of us to make some tough decisions and seek out common ground. But as I made clear at our last markup here in the Senate, we are moving ahead with strong bipartisan bills that can actually be passed and signed into law and which actually address the issues we all hear about back home and the many challenges we are seeing abroad. We've already passed three bills unanimously, and I hope thanks to everyone's hard work, we can keep that momentum going today. With that, I will turn to Vice Chair Collins for any comments she would like to make. Thank you, Madam Chair, for convening today's markup, which is our second of the fiscal 2025 appropriation cycle. <coughs> Excuse me. Discretionary spending makes up just over a quarter of the federal budget. However, its impacts are significant, affecting everything 
from public health and education to transportation, water and energy infrastructure, and vital national security and economic programs. As the chair has explained, today we will first consider the Commerce, Justice, and Science funding bill. This bill supports our state and local law enforcement, including through the Regional Information Sharing Systems Program that facilitates cooperation among federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, and the very popular BURN formula program that supports a range of activities from prosecution to prevention. The bill also funds research in critical science, scientific and technological fields that are necessary to ensure our economic and competitive strength. It supports oceans and fisheries programs that are vital to many of our coastal communities in Maine and other states. Let me join the chair in commending Chair Shaheen and Ranking Member Moran for their extraordinary work on this bill. Second, we will consider the interior and environment appropriations. This bill provides critical resources for programs geared toward providing clean drinking water and wastewater assistance to those that support conservation and management of our treasured national parks and public lands. The bill also funds important tribal programs and wildfire suppression. Let me express my appreciation for the great work of Chairman Merkley and Ranking Member Murkowski on this bill. We will move on to the Transportation and Housing and Urban Development Funding Bill, which supports initiatives to help improve our nation's infrastructure, including through the RAISE grant program and the Rural Bridge Program. It also invests in the FAA, supporting much needed additional air traffic controllers and the modernization of outdated systems. I'm especially pleased that this bill continues support for the shoreside infrastructure improvements at our nation's state maritime academies, including Maine Maritime Academy. The legislation maintains existing rental assistance for more than 4.5 million households and continues to make meaningful investments aimed at tackling the problem of homelessness, especially for our nation's veterans and youth. I thank Chairman Schatz and Ranking Member Hyde-Smith for their tremendous work on this bill which, as they both know, is one that I care a great deal about, having co-led the Transportation and Housing Subcommittee for a dozen years with Senator Reid. Uh, finally, I do hope that we will be able to consider the State Foreign Operations Appropriations Bill. It promotes regional security in the Middle East, including through military aid, to our ally Israel. It provides funding to continue to support Ukraine as it fights against Russians, Russia's unlawful invasion, and it would help counter China's malign influence around the globe. It also invests in life-saving global health, humanitarian assistance, and development programs. And it provides funding to combat the flow of fentanyl its precursor chemicals, and other synthetic drugs into the United States. Addictive drugs are pouring into our country, destroying families and communities, and must be stopped. I appreciate that Chairman Coons and Ranking Member Graham included new report language this year directing the Secretaries of State and Treasury to share with us relevant information they may have about the role of Chinese transnational criminal syndicates in marijuana grows and money laundering operations in Maine. This is a terrible problem in rural Maine, where an estimated 150 to 200 houses are being used for illegal marijuana growing operations. I want to thank both uh, Chairman Coons and Ranking Member Graham for their great work on this bill. I look forward to today's markup and uh, appreciate the hard work of all members. 
Yeah, we will now begin votes, and I note the presence of a quorum, and I will, uh, Senator Manchin, if you could just hold until we do the votes, and then I will turn to you. Um, I will now turn to Senator Collins to make the customary motions for the CJS interior and THUD bills. Madam Chair, I move that the committee report favorably an original bill making appropriations for commerce, justice, science, and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2025, and for other purposes. An original bill making appropriations for the Department of Interior, Environment, and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2025, and for other purposes. And an original bill making appropriations for the Departments of Transportation and Housing and Urban Development and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2025, and for other purposes, provided that each bill be subject to amendment and that each bill be consistent with its budget allocation, provided further that the chair of the committee or the chair of the subcommittee reporting the original bill be authorized to offer the substance of the original bill as a committee amendment in the nature of the substitute to the House companion measure. I would also point out that members do have the right uh, to change their vote depending on the adoption or non-adoption of the amendments. Is there an objection? Without objection, we will now vote to report the CJS bill favorably subject to amendment. The clerk will call the roll. Senator Durbin. Aye. <coughs> Aye. Senator Reed. Aye. Senator Tester. Aye. Senator Shaheen. Aye. Senator Merkley. Aye. Senator Coons. Aye. Senator Schatz. Senator Baldwin, Aye. Senator Murphy, Aye. Senator Manchin, Aye. Senator Van Hollen, Aye. Senator Heinrich, Aye. Senator Peters, Aye. Senator Sinema, Aye. Senator Collins, Aye. Senator McConnell, Aye by proxy, Senator Murkowski, Aye. Senator Graham, Aye. Senator Moran, Aye. Senator Hoven, yes. Senator Bozeman, Aye. Senator Capito, Aye. Senator Kennedy, Senator Heidsmith. Aye. Senator Haggerty. No. Senator Britt. Aye. Senator Rubio. No. Senator Fisher. Aye. Senator Murray. Aye. On this vote, there are 26 ayes, three nays. The motion to report the bill favorably is agreed to. Uh, next, we will vote to report the interior bill favorably, subject to amendment. The clerk will call the roll. Senator Durbin. Aye. Senator Reed. Aye. Senator Tester. Yes. Senator Shaheen. Aye. Senator Merkley. Senator Coons. Aye. Senator Schatz. Yes. Senator Baldwin. Aye. Senator Murphy. Aye. Senator Manchin. Aye. Senator Van Hollen, Aye. Senator Heinrich, Aye. Senator Peters, Aye. Senator Sinema, Aye. Senator Collins, Aye. Senator McConnell, Aye by proxy, Senator Murkowski, Aye. Senator Graham, Aye. Senator Aye. Moran, Aye. Senator Hoven, yes, <laughs> Senator Bozeman, Aye. Senator Capito, Aye. Senator Kennedy, Aye. Senator Hyde-Smith, Senator Haggerty. Aye. Senator Britt. Aye. Senator Rubio. Senator Fisher. Aye. And Senator Murray. Aye. <clears throat> On this vote, there are 28 ayes, one nay. The motion to report the bill favorably is agreed to. And we will now vote to report the T-HUD bill favorably, subject to amendment. The clerk will call the roll. Senator Durbin. Aye. Senator Reed. Aye. Senator Tester. Aye. Senator Shaheen. Aye. Senator Merkley. Aye. Senator Coons. Aye. Senator Schatz. Aye. Senator Baldwin. Aye. Senator Murphy. Aye. Senator Manchin. Aye. Senator Van Hollen. Aye. Senator Heinrich. Yes. Senator Peters. Aye. Senator Sinema. Senator Collins? Aye. Senator Murkowski? Aye. Senator McConnell? Aye by proxy. Senator Graham? Aye. Senator Moran? Aye. Senator Hoven? Aye. Senator Bozeman? Aye. 
Senator Capito? Aye. Senator Kennedy? Senator Hyde Smith? Aye. Senator Haggerty? Aye. Senator Britt? Aye. Senator Rubio? Aye. Senator Fisher? Aye. And Senator Murray? Aye. On this vote, there are 28 ayes, one nay. The motion to report the bill favorably is agreed to. And again, for the information of all committee members, we will vote to move forward on the SFOPS bill shortly. Um, I will give you a few minutes' notice before that vote occurs. Senator Collins, you had a motion you wanted to make. Yes. Madam Chair, as a courtesy to the leader, Senator McConnell has asked to be recorded. Thank you. As a courtesy to the leader, Senator McConnell has asked to be recorded as president voting yes on the Commerce, Justice, Science, Appropriations Bill, yes on the Interior, Environment and Related Agencies Bill, and yes on the Departments of Transportation, Housing and Urban Development and Related Agencies Appropriations Bill. I ask that the committee grant this request as it would not set a formal precedent nor would it change any vote outcomes. So ordered. Um, before we turn to the CJS, Senator Manchin, did you want to be recognized? Can, if you can turn your mic on. How about now? Well, I appreciate CJS Subcommittee Chair Shaheen and Ranking Member Moran's diligent efforts on this year's CJS Appropriations Bill. I could not in good conscience support the bill because of the grave concerns I still have, and I hope all of you think about this, NOAA's proposed vessel speed rule which is crazy and ludicrous. In 2022, NOAA proposed a rule that would require small recreational boats between 35 and 65 feet in length to travel at speeds below 10 knots for up to seven months of year, which goes clear out to 20 nautical miles, uh, stretching almost the entire length of the Atlantic coast. NOAA claims that this is the only thing that will protect the endangered North Atlantic right well. Let me be clear. This rule would absolutely devastate the entire recreational boating and fishing industry. It will force vessel operators to navigate choppy waters at dangerously low speeds, and it will economically be disastrous for the communities that depend on ocean tourism. It is ill-conceived and overreaching, but what's even worse is that it isn't, it isn't the only or even the best way to protect these endangered animals. NOAA proposed the expansion of this rule without first even attempting to engage with the boating and marine technology industry. Technology exists today that could be implemented immediately to protect all of the marine life at a risk of vessel strikes, including the North Atlantic right well. And this committee has acknowledged as much in the past, the fiscal year 2024 Commerce, Justice, and Science Bill, and my urging, including report language, encouraging NOAA to work with industry to support the testing and evaluation of the well, of the well monitoring technologies. It was only one and a half years after the rule was proposed. Think about that. After, the, after they proposed it. And NOAA bothered uh, to, ho uh, to host its first technology workshop. It took them a half, one and a half years to even have a workshop in March of this year to hear from stakeholders about the technology that already exists today to help detect and prevent vessel strikes. While this seemed to signal NOAA's openness to working with the industry to protect these animals rather than against it, it quickly became clear they had no interest in taking their input into account. NOAA sent the rule to OMB the very same week of the workshop, the same rule that they never heard anything about. With all the options available to us today, a blanket vehicle speed rule is an archaic and unsafe solution to a problem that could be addressed in a far effective way with technology. The Boating Industry's Well and Vessel Safety Task Force has published dozens of reports on the technologies available for deployment immediately. These include technology that can detect the nearby presence of whales and other marine mammals, trackers to monitor the real-time location of whales along the coast, and onboard data integrated into boats displays. Despite seeing this firsthand at the workshop, NOAA made it clear that they have no problem disregarding congressional intent and moving forward with this disastrous rule. So I appreciate, I truly do appreciate the subcommittee including additional language and funding for programs exploring alternatives to the VSR. I have no faith that the NOAA agency and the leadership they have right today will so much as look at their findings. I call on NOAA to consider the devastating impact this rule would have on recreational boating, fishing economy, and tourism, and the wealth and health and well-being of all economies along the coast. Um, so 
I strongly, uh, strongly oppose NOAA's position in not even trying to work in a most prosperous way with the technologies we have available. I would hope all of you would place, would really give your, uh, give your full-throated, uh, full-throated voice to this issue. NOAA has got to have some common sense. And if they don't have it within, the insta within their own system, then we have to give it to them here. Thank you, Madam Chairman. We are, we're ready to move forward on voting on the SFOPS bill. I'm waiting for a couple of committee members to come back. Uh, with the indulgence of everyone, if you could please stay here. Uh, we will move to that as soon as they return. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we will now turn to consideration of Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies Appropriations Bill. I want to thank Senators Shaheen and Moran and their subcommittee staff for working together and producing a strong bipartisan bill. I know it wasn't easy to do. This bill includes crucial investments in keeping our nation strong and competitive and our community safe, investments to support our workforce, promote U.S. businesses, and strengthen our trade and exports, investments to make sure we lead the world in research and new technologies like advanced manufacturing and AI, to name a few and investments in law enforcement working to prevent deadly drugs like fentanyl from reaching communities, stop corporate monopolies from trampling fair competition, and more. I'm especially pleased that this bill includes record funding for the Office on Violence Against Women. Some of this funding will also help build on important work I've championed to ensure survivors of sexual assault can get justice and the care that they need. These are truly worthwhile investments. With that, I will turn it over to Senator Shaheen for her opening remarks. Um, thank you very much, Chair Murray and Vice Chair Collins. I, I want to begin by thanking you first for your leadership on this committee, um, for your willingness to work together. I think you have set a model that has been very important for the rest of us on the committee to see, and also for the country to see, as I talk to um, constituents and businesses in New Hampshire, one of the most number one concerns they raise with me is the ability of us in Congress to work together. Um, so I think it's an example that I can share with my constituents. And also, from the business community, the most important thing they want is budget certainty. They want to know that we are passing budgets on time in a way that shows them um, what the government is funding. So I think this process allows us to go home and talk about um, how we are able to do that. And I thank you both very much for your leadership. I also want to thank my ranking member, um, Senator Moran, for being such a great partner. <clears throat> Whether he's been chair and I've been ranking member or I've been chair and he's been ranking member, we have worked closely together to produce bills that we are compromises that everyone can support. I want to thank his staff, Brian Danner, Kevin Wheeler, and Marcus Points for working closely with my staff to draft this important bill. Now, we held substantive hearings. We listened to the concerns of committee members and our Senate colleagues, and we worked to respond to the needs of the nation and all of our individual states. The 2025 CJS bill before us meets the subcommittee allocation of $73.7 billion in discretionary funding, and it continues investing in a wide range of programs that affect the lives of every American, prioritizes keeping our communities and nations safe and secure, furthering the nation, United States' leadership in science and innovation, and assisting the growth and prosperity of American businesses. And I want to give just a couple of examples of specifics from the bill. $740 million in the bill is for the Violence Against Women Act grants. This is the highest funding level that we ever um, put forward for these life-saving programs. $611 million is to fight the opioid epidemic, which my state of New Hampshire and I know many other um, states in the country are still battling. $288 million for the Department of Justice Antitrust Division. And we allow the agency to retain and use all of the pre-merger filing notification fees it collects in 2025, so it's <laughs> consistent with legislation that we passed in Congress. $11.2 billion to advance the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act, including $100 million for EDA's Regional Tech Hubs program, enough for two to five more implementation grants. $48 million for the new U.S. Artificial Intelligence Safety Institute at NIST, 
to help ensure that AI programs operate safely. $1.9 billion for NOAA's weather satellites, which are key to accurate weather prediction needed to protect life and property, including another hurricane hunter. $25.4 billion for NASA to return astronauts to the moon, including the first um, woman and person of color and maintain U.S. leadership in space. Now, these represent just some of the nearly 1,900 programmatic requests from senators that the committee has tried to meet, subcommittee has tried to meet. I think they made this bill better. We were glad to work with everyone on the committee and all of those senators we heard from. None of this would have been possible without the dedicated hard work of my staff, uh, Jess Berry, Mike Bernardzik, Blaise Sheridan, Lindsey Erickson, and Angela Callum. I thank them for their hard work. Now I'll turn to Ranking Member Moran for his remarks. And Senator Moran, before you begin, we are ready to move to SFOPS. I'm waiting for two com committee members to return. If that is your boss and you're a staff member here, will you please bring them back? And will nobody else please leave? <laughs> Senator Moran. Thank you, for, thank, you for pursuing, thank you for pursuing me an audience. Uh, Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you to you and Senator Collins for your leadership on this Appropriations Committee. And I, too, express my gratitude to Senator Shaheen and her staff for their kindness and capabilities of working together and finding common sense solutions uh, on any issues that we had difficulties with. And I express my gratitude to her staff, Jess Berry, Angela Collum, Blaise Sheridan, Mike Bedinarchik, and uh, Lindsey Erickson, and to the minority staff, Brian Danner, Kevin Wheeler, and Marcus Points. Um, this bill is fiscally responsible to my constituents who worry about the amount of money that we spend based upon the allocation that we received. This is a modest increase in what we were able to spend last year, and we used that money to try to fill in the gaps that uh, were created by last year's appropriations process and to try to meet some of the uh, dire or dramatic needs of some of the agencies that are the most important uh, to members of this committee. And uh, I think we were successful. We targeted our funding to uh, this, this uh, modest increase into uh, important national priorities. I would highlight those, and I would also, I guess, point out that while we have increased uh, spending slightly, we are still spending, which may be true of many other subcommittees, less than we did just two years ago. So our priorities consisted of helping the DEA uh, dismantle the Mexican cartels uh, in a fight against fentanyl. Uh, in last year's funding, DEA's positions were, the funding available for their positions was sig significantly limited, and we're trying to help them return to, to keep the agents uh, in business. Uh, support for local law enforcement, local police departments and sheriff's departments and efforts to combat rising violent crime uh, through significant program increases, for example, to the Burn JAG grant program. Maintain the National Weather Service's life-saving weather forecasting capabilities. Uh, continue the efforts at cutting-edge artificial intelligence and quantum information research at NIST and the National Science Foundation. We increase the amount of money that the National Science Foundation will, will receive. In last year's appropriations process, it was uh, significantly reduced. And finally, space exploration, including NASA's Artemis mission to the moon and to maintain our strategic advantage uh, over China. Um, just in a, in a broader way, I would say this bill is, is, in many, uh, is part of many components in our efforts at improving our national security and our economic well-being, particularly as we face challenges from China and its efforts to do uh, harm to the United States of America. Uh, again, I'm grateful to uh, Senator Shaheen. I thank the chairman and ranking member for um, the allocation that we received, and we tried to spend that money in the best way possible for the taxpayers uh, of uh, Kansas and the United States. I yield the floor. Thank you. Um, we will move on the manager's package, and as soon as that is complete, I'm going to move to SFOPS. If your boss is not in the room, tell him. Um, Senator Sheen, you have a manager's package. I do. I do. I would like to offer this manager's package, which has been distributed, I think, to all senators, 
the provisions have been cleared on both sides. It's a package of amendments that I think improves the bill, and I ask the committee to adopt the manager's package by a voice vote. Is there any objections? Madam Chair. Senator Moran. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, I support the adoption of the manager's package, and I would highlight that uh, it includes uh, an amendment that I suggested uh, to require the FBI to investigate and provide Congress with a public report on the assassination attempt of President Trump. Without objection, so ordered. Ready to um, we will now move to vote on the SFOP's final passage. I will turn to Senator Collins to make the customary motion for the uh, SFOP's bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that the committee report favorably an original bill making appropriations for the Department of State foreign operations and related programs for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2025, and for other purposes, provided that the bill be subject to amendment and that the bill be consistent with its budget allocation, provided further that the chair of the committee or the chair of the subcommittee reporting the original bill be authorized to offer the substance of the original bill as a committee amendment in the nature of a substitute to the House companion measure, provided further that any senator wishing to change his or her vote to report during this meeting, the committee be able to do so by notifying the chair. Without objection, uh, we will now move to report the SFOPS bill favorably, subject to amendment. The clerk will call the roll. Senator Durbin. Aye. Senator Reed. Aye. Senator Tester. Aye. Senator Shaheen. Aye. Senator Merkley. Aye. Senator Coons. Aye. Senator Schatz, Senator Baldwin, Aye. Senator Murphy, Aye. Senator Manchin, Senator Manchin, Senator Van Hollen, Aye. Senator Heinrich, Aye. Senator Peters, Aye. Senator Sinema, Aye. Senator Collins, Aye. Senator McConnell, Aye by proxy, Senator Murkowski, Aye. Senator Graham, Aye. Senator Moran, Aye. Senator Hoban, Senator Bozeman, we did. Senator Capito, we did. Senator Kennedy, Aye. Senator Hydesmith, Aye. Senator Haggerty, Aye. Senator Britt, Aye. Senator Rubio, no. Senator Fisher, and Senator Murray. Aye. The vote is now 27 ayes, two nays. The motion is agreed to. Senator Collins. Madam Chair, as a courtesy to the leader, Senator McConnell has asked to be recorded as present in voting. Yes, on the Department of State Foreign Ops and Related Appropriations Bill. I ask that the committee grant this request as it would not set a formal precedent, nor would it change any vote outcomes. Without objection, so agreed to. Um, with that, um, sorry for the pause on the CJS bill. We will turn back to that. Are there any members? Madam Chair. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to make a comment about Senator the CJS Capito. bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mad Madam Chair. And I want to thank the, the chair and uh, ranking member of that subcommittee. But I'm very disappointed in the recent NASA decision to cancel the Viper rover on Na uh, at NASA. This mission would be a major advancement for Artemis. Due to the funding implications and timing of the announcement, I'm not asking for action uh, at this markup, but I respectfully ask that you and Senator that you, uh, Madam Chair, and Senator Moran, to please work with me as the bill moves forward to look for ways to repurpose the lander portion of this mission to advance Moon to Mars objectives. The mission directly supports a national imperative for continued U.S. leadership in science and exploration in the face of urgent geopolitical competition. So can we work together as we move this bill? Absolutely. Thank you. Are there any members wishing Madam to Chair. speak to or offer an amendment? Yes. Senator Haggerty. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the, um, the chairman, vice chairman, I appreciate your work, and also the subcommittee, Chair, <coughs> Chair Shaheen and ranking member Moran. Thank you for your work on this. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Senator Manchin for his comments and associate myself with his comments. Tennessee is a robust boat manufacturing uh, industry. Um, Noah's behavior, as you so eloquently described, Senator Manchin, is unconscionable. It's clear it's devoid of any sort of cost-benefit analysis, and I would look forward to working with you to address this concern. To turn back to my amendment, <clears throat> I'm posing an amendment that poses a very simple question. That question is, who has the final say over our bill? This committee 
or a special counsel not confirmed by the Senate. More specifically, will this committee allow such an actor to override our judgment without our approval and allow such an actor to defund the resources we provide for real law enforcement against dangerous criminals? In fiscal year 2023, more than $11 million in funds provided by this committee for law enforcement were diverted to special counsel Jack Smith's investigation of the Republican presidential okay. candidate. Sorry. For fiscal year 2024, <clears throat> the Department of Justice hasn't yet reported these numbers, Interior. but given Jack Smith's election year escalations and repeated defeats in court, this diversion of law enforcement funds is no doubt even worse this fiscal year. That means less money for law enforcement due to the diversion. My amendment is simple. It would prohibit the law enforcement funding that's provided by this committee from being defunded without our committee's approval. My amendment would protect the constitutional prerogative of this committee over the resources that we provide. In my view, Jack Smith should not have the power to override this committee and co-opt for his political prosecution the resources that we have provided for true law enforcement. The question is simple. Do you support protecting the constitutional prerogative of this committee and closing the trap door that is allowing Jack Smith to defund our law enforcement resources? My amendment will ensure that law enforcement resources that this committee provides go toward stopping dangerous criminals, not presidential candidates. I ask for a roll call vote and urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Thank you. Senator Shaheen. Um, I appreciate Senator Haggerty's concerns, but the appointment of the special counsel is important and it shouldn't be taken lightly, as we've seen several times in recent years. It's important to protect the special counsel's independence, regardless of which party controls the White House or the Department of Justice, because we need to ensure to the American people that they can have confidence in these investigations. They need to be conducted in an open and transparent manner. They need to be given the full resources they need, and I worry that giving any attorney general the power to reimburse the salaries of DOJ employees who provide support for the special counsel but do not work directly for the special counsel would give the attorney general too much power over the budget and therefore the special counsel's office itself and that would potentially weaken the special counsel's independence. Um, furthermore, under the Haggerty Amendment, FBI agents and marshals will still be under operation control of the Attorney General, since it would be up to the Attorney General to reimburse their expenses. Um, this would upend how this process has worked in the past. Um, and CBO is now telling us that this amendment will score additional budget authority as written, um, and it doesn't have an offset. So if it passes as is, it will kill the bill. So I urge my colleagues to vote against it. Madam Chair, may I respond? Yes, Senator Hagerty. Um, thank you very much for your comments, Chair Shaheen. I appreciate the, 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 the thoughts that you convey, but I would say this. Giving the Attorney General power to reimburse certainly is far better than giving a non-confirmed special counsel the power to divert funds that this committee has provided in discretionary funding. There are other mandatory accounts that have jurisdiction under other committees where these special counsels are to be funded. This is about the constitutional prerogative of our committee. It's also about an abuse of taking discretionary funding right. and moving That's it right. into a different direction beyond our authority. Uh, I understand the fact that there's been a, a number that has been scored by CBO, but there have been a number of budget gimmicks that have taken place here to get to the place we need to be today. I don't want to stand or allow budget gimmicks to get in the way to, with some small number to stop us from taking back our authority and stop the misuse of these funds by a special counsel that has not even been a, confirmed by the United States Senate. Are there any other senators who wish to comment on this amendment? Senator uh, Collins. Colleagues, this amendment is very carefully drafted, <clears throat> and that is why I support it. It does not defund special counsels. Rather, it ensures that the funds that are provided to DOJ components, such as the FBI or the Marshal Service, are used for their intended purpose. If the special counsel wants to use the FBI or the Marshal Service, he still can do so. 
but he needs to reimburse for taking those resources out of the department. This is carefully drafted. It reaffirms the role that we in Congress have when we appropriate money for the Attorney General and its component agencies. The special counsel has access to funding through a permanent indefinite appropriation. What the problem is, is the special counsel is not fully reimbursing the components of the Justice Department, and that's not right. So I support this amendment and hope that people will take a close look at what it actually does. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair. Uh, yes. So, Senator Madam Kennedy. Chair, um, I, I want to associate myself with Senator Haggerty's and Senator Collins' comments. Uh, I appreciate Senator Shaheen's um, concerns, well-placed as usual, but uh, I think if you read the amendment carefully, it is drafted in such a way that it address, addresses Senator Sheehan's um, um, very legitimate concerns. And for that reason, I'm going to uh, vote for the amendment, and I would ask my colleagues and friends to uh, read the amendment carefully. You will see that it is very artfully drafted. Uh, with that, let me just say that the appointment of a special counsel is really important and not taken lightly as we have seen several times in recent years. It is really important to respect and protect the special counsel's office, regardless of which party controls the White House, the Department of Justice, or Congress, because all of us need to make sure that uh, that the American people have full confidence in these investigations. They need to be conducted in an open and transparent manner and be given the full resources that they need. There is a bright line between Justice Department employees formally detailed to a special counsel's office versus department employees who support the special counsel but are not formally detailed to that office. Employees formally detailed to a special counsel are reimbursed by the permanent and indefinite appropriation for independent counsels because those employees directly report to the special counsel, not the attorney general. This amendment would actually append how special counsels and the Justice Department have worked together on numerous investigations over many decades. We've got to maintain and ensure the independence of the special counsel's office, and I really worry that this amendment may have the potential to diminish that independence or have un other unintended consequences. Uh, so I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. Is Madam there Chair, may I make one further brief comment? Senator Haggerty. Thank you. Um, the magnitude of the diversion that's taken place here is significant. In 2023, $11 million alone. Diverted, not reimbursed. In 2024, given the proceedings that have been undertaken by Special Counsel Jack Smith and the fact that he loses in court, I'm sure that number is probably escalated beyond twice that, perhaps $30 million. Uh, we did not appropriate these funds. We have an actor who's not confirmed by the United States Senate who is making the decision on his own to divert those funds away from legitimate law enforcement, which is what this committee has established, and moved it to something to support his political prosecutions. This is something that if the, if the Department of Justice or the Attorney General wants funds for this purpose, should seek them openly. There is a mandatory account that's under the Judiciary Department. They should work with those funds, but they should not be taking funds that we have constitutional prerogative to direct and move them without any permission from this committee. Thank you. Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Kennedy. Madam Chair, I don't understand why we persist in giving away our power. Um, all, this, all this amendment does is reclaim a small portion of our power. Uh, it, it is our job to make these decisions. This doesn't hurt the Attorney General. This doesn't hurt the Office of Special Counsel. Th this, this, this just reclaims the power that was originally ours until, until we gave it away. I mean, what are we here for? We're supposed to appropriate the money not give carte blanche to, an, to a, an inferior officer. 
Um, and and I, I appreciate your concerns, Madam Chair, and Senator Shaheen's, but this amendment addresses it. And this is not going to cause the world to spin off its axis. This, is just, this just reclaims Congress's power to appropriate in, in a transparent and fulsome way. And, and I don't understand the concern for the life of me. Senator Durbin. I wasn't going to comment on this, but I want to say a word. Uh, this uh, special counsel statute is explicit in what it does. It gives to the attorney general the power to appoint a special counsel in extraordinary cases. He determines that criminal investigation of a person or matter is warranted, that the investigation or prosecution of that person by a U.S. attorney's office or litigating division of the Department of Justice would present a conflict of interest for the department or other extraordinary circumstances and that under the circumstances be in the public interest to appoint an outside special counsel. So what kind of special counsels have been appointed? Attorney General Merrick Garland appointed U.S. Attorney David Weiss as a special counsel to prevent the appearance of political interference in the investigation and prosecution of Hunter Biden. Keep in mind that Mr. Weiss is a Republican who was appointed by former President Trump. And Attorney General Garland appointed Special Counsel Robert Hur to investigate the classified documents found at President Biden's properties. If the Haggerty Amendment becomes law, we stand the risk of jeopardizing this effort to avoid conflicts of interest. Yes, Senator Kennedy, there is a question of giving up our jurisdiction, but for an express purpose and a situation it warrants it. I think long and hard before I support this amendment. I think Senator Shaheen is right. There's budgetary consequences as well. I hope we defeat the Haggerty Amendment. Are there any other senators who wish to speak? I'm Chair, I'd like to speak briefly if I might. Senator Haggerty. Um, thank you, Senator Durbin, for your comments. I would just like to be clear that this would apply to any of the special counsels that reach across and redirect funds that we have appropriated in a discretionary basis. It's not particular to Jack Smith. It's just that Jack Smith has been such an egregious example of this misappropriation of funds. What we're trying to do is reclaim our authority as a committee. That's what I'm trying to do. This is a major process file, setting the politics aside. And I don't think it jeopardizes in any way the Attorney General's ability to achieve the job. There are, there are other mandatory categories where these funds may come from. That's where they should come from, unless they come back to this committee and have permission to do so. Thank you very much. Senator Shaheen. Um, just a final word, because I know we don't want to prolong the debate, but I, I appreciate the concerns that both you and Senator Kennedy are raising, Senator Haggerty. But the reality is what I fear this amendment would do is compromise the independence of the special counsel. And that's not in anybody's interest, regardless of who, what administration is in power and who the special counsel is. What this amendment would do is throw it back to the committee in a way that um, could potentially provide for partisan divides over how the special counsel operates. And I don't, again, I don't think, I think that undermines the independence and credibility in the, with the American public, and that is not a good thing. So that's why that and the fact that um, CBO says this would kill the bill um, because it doesn't have an offset. Um, but I think the independence question is really the fundamental one that's called into question by your amendment. Ma Madam Chair, just this one is very brief response to that. Um, what we have is a situation where funds that are appropriated to this committee have been diverted. They've been diverted without anyone's permission. And what I'm trying to do is clean that up and regain the authority for this committee in terms of the budgetary consequences. As I said, there have been a number of rescissions that have been talked about. This can be easily worked through that process. This is a minor number, but it's an important principle. And I encourage all of my colleagues to vote with me on this amendment. Thank Does you Does the much. Senator request a roll call vote? I do. I do. Clerk will call the roll. Senator Durbin. No. Senator Reed. No. Senator Tester. No. Senator Shaheen. No. Senator Merkley. No. Senator Coons. Senator Schatz. No. Senator Baldwin. No. Senator Murphy. No. Senator Manchin. No. Senator Van Hollen. No. no by proxy. No by proxy. Senator Heinrich. No. Senator Peters. No by proxy. Senator Sinema. No. Senator Collins. Aye. 
Senator McConnell? Aye, by proxy. Senator Murkowski? Aye. Senator Graham? Aye. Senator Moran? Aye. Senator Hoban? Aye. Senator Bozeman? Aye. Senator Capito? Aye. Senator Kennedy? Aye. Senator Hyde Smith? Aye. Senator Haggerty? Aye. Senator Britt? Aye. Senator Rubio? Aye, by proxy. Senator Fisher? Aye. Senator Murray? Uh, no. On this vote, there are 14 ayes, 15 nays. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there any other members uh, who wish to speak or offer an amendment on this bill? Seeing none, this bill will be reported as amended. With that, we will move uh, to consideration of the FY25 bill recommended by the Interior, Environment, and Related Agencies Subcommittee. I want to thank Senators Merkley and Senator Murkowski uh, and all of their staffs for their really important work on this bill. I'm really pleased we were able to work in a bipartisan way to craft a bill that helps us live up to our obligations to tribes, protects our federal firefighters from a pay cut, that would seriously weaken our wildfire safety efforts by making sure the current pay levels are permanent, invests in our core environmental and conservation efforts, and not only increases funding for the Indian Health Service to maintain current staffing levels and fully fund staffing at newly opened facilities, but once again includes advanced appropriations to help provide certainty and stability for a healthcare system that serves millions of patients. These are investments that directly affect the lives of many people and protect precious natural resources. I am pleased to have a bipartisan bill that shows we understand that. Before I do turn things over to Senator Merkley and Senator Murkowski, I do want to highlight uh, a part of this bill. It's a very thoughtful tribute they have included in this bill to honor the late Senator Dianne Feinstein, who served on this committee for 25 years. The interior bill includes a provision naming a visitor center in Joshua Tree National Park after Senator Feinstein. This is fitting because one of her first major accomplishments in the Senate was the California Desert Protection Act of 1994 that created Joshua Tree National Park along with Death Valley National Park and the Mojave National Preserve. I remember well her dogged determination on that bill, strong-arming 48 co-sponsors, including me, as an original co-sponsor, getting that bill across the Senate floor and to President Clinton's desk. She was a fierce advocate for getting this done, just like with everything Senator Feinstein put on her agenda. So uh, I just want everyone to know that's in this bill, and I'm honored that it is, and I want to thank Senator Merkley, Senator Murkowski, for including it. With that, I will turn it over to Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Murray and Vice Chair Collins, and thank you for that tribute to Senator Feinstein. It's hard to believe that here we are for the first time in 25 years without Senator Feinstein sitting alongside us. She did love the Joshua Tree National Park, and so renaming the Visitor Center in her honor is completely appropriate. And for anyone who hasn't visited that park, it's a very cool place to go. As my predecessor on this committee, she worked hard to protect and preserve all of our special places, and we're continuing that legacy today with this bill. Together with Ranking Member Murkowski, I'm proud to present this bipartisan bill to the committee. We certainly have many challenges regarding our public lands. This past Sunday, July 21st, was the hottest day in human history, following the hottest year in human history. And this extreme climate chaos threatens everything that we are charged with protecting, air quality, drinking water, wildlife, forests, ecosystems. As we sit here at this moment, in Oregon, 800,000 acres are ablaze. It's more than every other state in the country combined. This bill prioritizes fighting wildfires. It permanently increases wildfire pay, or firefighter pay, so that the brave men and women who risk their lives to protect our communities and our natural resources can count on that well-deserved pay increase to continue year after year. 
It fully funds federal wildfire suppression and preparedness needs at $6.1 billion, including $2.75 billion for the reserve fund. We must not allow the situation where we run out of funds to fight the fires. It also includes about half a billion dollars to reduce hazardous fuels. Many of us would love to see a lot more done up front to make our forests more fire resilient so the fires are not nearly as bad as they are. We need to keep expanding that strategy, that effort. And it includes funds for wildfire smoke mitigation grants. Wildfire smoke is now an increasing challenge. Ranking Member Murkowski and I have also made targeted increases to address other issues, including funding to staff new Indian health service facilities, funding for tribal uh, public uh, safety and justice, an increase for the National Park Service to retain staff and hire 450 new park rangers. We have been grossly uh, understaffed in our National Park Service. And funding to address the infrastructure and employee housing crisis in the parks, forests, wildlife, refuges, and other federal lands. As the price of housing has gone up and the available housing for employees has disappeared, it's been a real challenge. There are modest increases for clean air programs, for toxic chemical reviews, and full funding for payment in lieu of taxes. I am disappointed that the bill we have today continues to hold some harmful legacy policy writers, which I don't believe belong in this bill, but we are in the challenge of having a bipartisan process going forward, and that is part of the deal that we have made. I'll continue to work every year to find an opportunity to put science back in charge. Before I close, a huge thank you to my team and to Senator Murkowski's team for working in such a bipartisan spirit on such a challenging bill. On my team, Melissa Zimmerman, Ryan Hunt, Anthony Cedillo, and Rishi Sagal, they have done incredible work. And on Senator Murkowski's team, Emmy Lasofsky and Lucas Agnew. Thank you directly to my partner in this, Senator Murkowski. It's our fourth year working together on this subcommittee. Uh, and there are a lot of complicated issues to be worked through in the process, so I've really appreciated that bipartisan spirit. I now yield back to the chair. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you to, uh, to you, Senator Merkley, and your team for the working relationship that we have established. I want to recognize and thank the chair and the ranking member for your work in bringing us here today to... Um, to really have actual input on bills is so meaningful, it's so important. It, it benefits the appropriations process, but also the constituents we serve. So thank you for pushing us to get to this place. Um, every bill has its unique challenges. Uh, we all recognize that, and certainly the interior and environment bill is no different. But I really think that working uh, with Chairman Merkley here, we have struck the right balance on energy development, parks, conservation, and the arts, while also meeting wildland, fire, and tribal trust responsibilities. I think we have worked to find the right funding balance for the many needs that we have. With the emergency funding that's provided, I'm happy to report that the bill does fully fund wildland fire preparedness and the suppression needs. I think we all recognize that this must be a priority. We also fully support our wildland firefighters and ensure that they receive the pay that they deserve and make investments in wellness programs and firefighting, firefighter housing, which are critical to our federal firefighter retention efforts. Um, we also fully fund our responsibility for tribal lease payments and contract support costs. This, is, this has been a tough part of our budget. We saw with the recent Supreme Court decision uh, nearly three quarters of a billion dollars in increased costs resulting from that, but uh, we, we fulfill our obligation there with regards to the 105L leases and our contract supports. As the chairman noted, we also fully fund PILT that so many of our public lands counties rely on. Water infrastructure programs, uh, cleanup and remediation programs at the EPA are maintained or increased. We also aid communities in achieving and delivering cleaner air, cleaner water, and, and cleaner lands. Our, our 
our work is far from over on this. I think we all recognize that, but I do appreciate the committee's leadership for getting us to where we are today. Throughout the remainder of this year, I'm looking forward to working with all of my colleagues in the House and the Senate to, to work to deliver a strong bill. I also want to recognize the hard work of the staffs. They really do put in incredible effort. Um, on the majority staff, it's Melissa, Ryan, Anthony, Rishi, and Angela. I also want to recognize my, my Chief Clerk, uh, Emmy Lefosky, and Lucas Agnew, and to recognize that Lucas is going to be retiring uh, leaving the interior staff after nine years on the Appropriations Committee. Mm -hmm. So we're losing a great resource. And Lucas, I just want to thank you for all the work that you have done. <laughs> thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to the chair. Thank you. Um, Senator Merkley, you have a manager's package. Yes, Madam Chair, I sure do. Um, and uh, this has been put together with the approval uh, being of members on both sides. It's been completely cleared, and I, I move to approve this package. Are there any objections? Seeing none, the package is approved. Are there any members wishing to speak or offer an amendment? Yes, Madam Chair. Senator Merkley. Madam Chair, I'd like to offer an amendment to reclassify the tribal sovereignty payments to the mandatory side of the budget on behalf of myself and co-sponsors. Those co-sponsors include Chair Murray, the Chairman of the Indian Affairs Committee, Chairman Schatz, and Senators Tester, Sinema, Heinrich, Durbin, Coons, Baldwin, Van Hollen, Peter, Shaheen, and Reed. I understand that there's some need here to make folks familiar with the issue, but essentially it boils down to this. The courts have weighed in and said that these payments are required by law, and just a recent court decision increased the amount significantly. The cost charged to Interior Bill is $2.8 billion, an increase of $1.2 billion to the enacted level. And under the budget caps, that's a, a very, very significant factor and affecting really all of the other things that we're responsible for in the context of, of public uh, lands. So it makes a lot of sense, since the courts have said this has to be mandatory, to in fact have it be on the mandatory side. The amendment says we should start that process in FY26 uh, and um, therefore we can plan for it. It also provides adjustments that any budget camps and caps in fiscal 26 would be reduced proportionally. So this is not a gimmick to increase the overall money in the, in the future. There would be no windfall savings, although as uh, invested as I am in interior, I wouldn't mind some windfall savings to be invested more into our public lands. So that's the, the story. Uh, and that's why I think we should do this. We do not have the support today to, to do this. I want to continue to uh, raise the issue, uh, have people familiar with the issue, because it will affect uh, the interior budget for a long time to come. And so with that, I will with, withdraw. But I really thank all the co-sponsors who have weighed in and said what the courts have said is mandatory, needs to be mandatory, so we can focus on the discretionary programs that are so important across our nation. Senator Merkley, before you withdraw, I believe there's several members who want to speak on this amendment. I, I withdraw my withdrawal. <laughs> <laughs> Are Madam Chairman. Yes, Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, to, to Chairman Merkley here, know that I absolutely appreciate your remarks. I agree and understand that uh, as far as meeting our obligation to fully fund contract support costs and the tribal lease payment, Payments. This is not this is not a negotiable thing. Uh, the courts have clearly said that the, these payments are critical to the delivery of, of services across Indian Country. We recognize that. Um, you and I know how the demands on these accounts have just continued to grow and grow, and it becomes an increasingly difficult part of our budget as we try to reconcile things. So it's something that we absolutely need to, to work through this process, yes. and uh, doing it together, I think, is going to be important. So uh, you've got me uh, on your side to try to advance this as we move forward. I appreciate your, your comments, and, and I'm hoping that maybe we can have enough discussion of this to think about whether there might be an opportunity uh, if there is a conference on the FY25 bill. Are there any other members who want to wish us to speak on this amendment? 
If not, I just want to say, Chair Merkley, thank you for your leadership on this. Earlier this year, as she stated, the Supreme Court passed down a very important ruling for tribal self-determination and sovereignty, one that really underscored the work that remains if we're serious about our commitments to tribes across the nation. I absolutely agree with my colleagues who believe that keeping our word to our tribes is not optional. And I support the effort to make tribal sovereignty payments mandatory. Uh, as Senator uh, Merkley and President Biden and others have suggested, so we can make certain our commitment to our tribes is ironclad. But we do need bipartisan support to make that happen. We're not quite there yet, and I know there are members on both sides who feel strongly about standing with our tribal communities. So I will continue to work with you, Senator Merkley, and I'm really glad that you're championing this effort. Thank you. With that, are there any other members who wish to offer an amendment or speak on the bill? Madam Chair. Senator yes. Capito. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank uh, the chair and ranking member of the subcommittee. In particular, I would like to thank your staff, Senator Murkowski, and working uh, MAN Lucas, as he's on his way out, uh, for, uh, no, Lucas is, right, yes, just Lucas, not, I mean, we're not, anyway, uh, for their work on this bill. I know we are working under significant constraints, but there's one area I want to highlight that I know is of concern. We need more oversight over the $41 billion that are being spent in the Inflation Reduction Act Fund, which the EPA is distributing. The IRA provided no resources to the EPA Inspector General to oversee this funding, and we keep discovering more and more federal funds that are going to radical groups that support anti-American, anti-police, and anti-Semitic causes, which have nothing to do with protecting the environment. I appreciate the funds provided for the IG in this bill, and I just want this committee to know that even more needs to be done. There is no, uh, there is so much more that needs to be investigated here. I'm offering this amendment that would provide 15 million for the EPA Inspector General to investigate the distribution of these funds. But I will withdraw the amendment, knowing the f fiscal constraints that we are under. But I want to be able to work with the leadership of these commit of the subcommittee center. Senators uh, Merkley and Murkowski on this dire need for oversight as the process moves along. No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Senator Merkley, it is in order for you to withdraw your amendment. My amendment now is withdrawn. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Murkowski. Madam Chair, I just want to comment to Senator uh, Capito here. I too share the concern about uh, the oversight, um, significant, significant resources that. Um, are provided to the EPA through the In Inflation Reduction Act. Um, as you know, we, we do have funding, $5 million, in, uh, in the budget here for the EPA Inspector General uh, to expand their oversight of this. I agree with you. I think that there needs to be uh, additional, but know that we're certainly going to be working to provide pr proper oversight uh, of the uh, EPA's um, IRA funding. So uh, it is an issue, I think, that we're, we're all focused on, so we'll be looking at it with you. Thank you. Are there any other members who wish to speak on this amendment? Yeah, uh, and you withdrew? My amendment, yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any other amendments or members who wish to speak on this? Senator Tester. Um, I want to thank the committee for uh, moving forth some good bipartisan appropriation bills to the floor. And I very much appreciate the leadership of Chair Murray and, and Vice Chair Collins. Uh, I also appreciate the leadership of Chair Merkley and Ranking Member Murkowski on the Interior Bill. Uh, many of us have been here for a bit can remember damn near every appropriation bill would pass except for the Interior Bill. And so I want to thank you two for getting to yes and striking a balance on, on difficult issues. And I very much appreciate that. I want to raise an issue in front of this committee right now that uh, directly affects Montana, directly affects the country, and it's about uh, the administration's recent EPA MATS rule. And it's, this isn't about whether you like the MATS rule or don't like the MATS rule. This is about an EPA's acknowledgement that um, one of the only power plants this affects is in Coal Strip, Montana. Uh, this isn't the way we should be making rules. This power plant has been around for a while. It is scheduled to be phased out over the next decade. Uh, the investment that would be required to update the controls to meet this rule would be hundreds of millions of dollars. Without the investment, the plant would be required to shut down by 2028. 
I have made it clear both to President and Administrator Reagan that it is not acceptable that the federal government issue a rule that targets uh, retiring this plant without providing a reasonable timeline to replace the jobs and the energy production uh, uh, lost. Everybody knows that in my real life I'm a farmer. Clean air and clean water are critical uh, to me to be able to raise a crop. And it's also critical for everybody in this country. Clean air and clean water is critical for our health and for our economy. But rules made in Washington, D.C. need to be rooted in reality and common sense. And what I've heard from the folks of my state is that the match rule simply makes no sense under these circumstances, and I agree. Uh, we don't have a solution for the coal strip in this bill today. I would look forward to finding a bar bipartisan path forward that resolves this issue while maintaining our clean air and clean water. That's where we work in Montana, and that's where we should work in, in uh, the United States Senate. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Tester. Are there any other members who wish to comment on this bill? Seeing none, this bill will be reported as amended. At this time, we will turn to the THUD bill. Um, the, uh, and I want to thank Senator Schatz and Senator Hyde-Smith um, and all of your staff for working on this really important bill. The TIAD bill addresses many of our families' businesses and communities across the country, including making sure our families are not kicked out of their homes, produces more affordable housing, keeps the commuters who travel our nation each day safe, and rebuilds America's roads and bridges and a lot more. These investments in our transportation infrastructure will create jobs and help strengthen our nation's economic competitiveness for decades to come. And housing assistance and homeless interventions are a lifeline for millions of families that are one paycheck away from a street. I also want to thank Chairman Schatz and Ranking Member Hyde-Smith for the new steps this bill takes to recognize the connections between health outcomes and housing and the needs of our seniors who are experiencing homelessness. So that, with that, I will turn it over to you, Senator Schatz. Thank you very much, Chair Murray and Vice Chair Collins, for your leadership and your commitment to return this committee to the regular order and preserve our longstanding tradition of bipartisanship. It's a tradition that Vice Chair Hyde-Smith and I strongly share and have carried forward in this uh, Senate mark for our bill. It is a strong bipartisan bill under the circumstances, and I'm very proud of the investments that we're able to make. Overall, this bill provides $98.7 billion in total discretionary funding, of which $28.5 billion is for Department of Transportation. $78.2 billion is for programmatic spending at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And $453 million is for the seven independent agencies uh, funded under this act. For DOT, our agreement is keenly focused on aviation safety. We've targeted funding to address our aging facilities and equipment and add more air traffic controllers to meet the demands of commercial air carriers safely certification specialists to process the vast volume of innovations in manufacturing, and inspectors to oversee aircraft production and air carrier maintenance. Ensuring the safety of the most complex avi aviation system in the world and maintaining its 24-7 operations is challenging. We do what we can with the resources we have, but Congress need, need, needs to think more broadly about the budget's mandatory proposal, because as it stands, with the caps, it'll take a century, a century before we can recapitalize all of FAA's aging infrastructure. Addressing our national housing shortage is equally difficult. The current housing shortage did not happen overnight. It is a product of decades and decades of broken and discriminatory housing policies that have made it all but impossible to build the housing that we need. As a result, home ownership is increasingly out of reach for more and more people, rent skyrockets, and homelessness is setting grim records. The key solution here is pretty clear. We need to make it easier for people to build housing. This bill makes important investments to do just that. We've included $1.425 billion in funding for the HOME program, $3.3 billion for CDBG formula grants, $1.5 billion for native housing, $100 million for new permanent supportive housing, $115 million for new elderly housing construction, and $100 million for the pathways to removing obstacles to housing program. To make sure we don't lose ground, this bill reaffirms our longstanding commitment to preserve assistance for the nearly 10 million 
people across the country who, lie, who rely on HUD's programs. The bill also makes new investments to rehabilitate and preserve distressed properties in the existing housing stock. Before I close, I want to thank the T-HUD staff who've worked tirelessly to produce the best possible bill that addresses the various challenges that we face. They include Mike Clark, Jason Woolwine, Cameron O'Brien, Rajat Mathur, Jessica Sun, Kelsey Daniels, Amanda Cronenberger, and, Dan and Dabney Haig. All of you work incredibly hard and under very difficult circumstances. Two final things. I do want to recognize my vice chair. It's been an incredibly um, pleasant and constructive partnership. I very much enjoy um, working with you. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that all of us need to pass a disaster supplemental. I know this is not on the T-HUD topic, but in the interest of time, I wanted to flag that the people of Maui, the people of Texas, the people of Vermont, the people of California, the people of Mississippi, and many other states are waiting for the federal government to fulfill its obligation um, in the wake of disasters. Thank you, Chair. Senator Hyde-Smith. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Chair, Chairman Schatz, as well. I appreciate the collaborative approach that you and your team uh, throughout this bill writing process, again, have displayed. I also want to thank Chairman Murray and Vice Chair Collins for their strong leadership of this committee, continuing to keep us on track and on schedule as we work to fulfill one of Congress's most fundamental responsibilities. The fiscal year 2025 Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development and Related Agencies Appropriations Bill is a fiscally responsible bill that adheres to the budgetary constraints that this committee must operate within. The bill includes $28.5 billion for the Department of Transportation, $79.8 billion for HUD, and $454 million for independent agencies, including the National Transportation Safety Board and the Federal Maritime Commission. Accounting for the scoring adjustments of last year's Schumer-Johnson budget deal, the funding level provided by this bill is relatively flat when compared to the fiscal year 2024 enacted level. The bill achieves this cut without sacrificing transportation safety or critical rental assistance programs. For example, the bill includes increases for an additional 2,000 air traffic controllers to address significant delays and in safety incidences in the national airspace system. Funding is also included for additional aviation safety inspectors to oversee aviation manufacturing deficiencies as well as additional rail safety inspectors. The bill continues key investments to improve our nation's transportation infrastructure, including $550 million for the RAISE program, $300 million for the Rail Infrastructure and Safety Grants, and $200 million for Port Infrastructure Development Grants. At the same time, the bill continues to fully fund existing rental assistance for more than 4.5 million households to ensure that seniors, the disabled, and working families who currently receive such assistance are not put at risk of homelessness. Additional investments are made to support ending veteran and youth homelessness, as well as to develop more permanent supportive housing. The bill also maintains level funding for $3.3 billion for the CDBG program, which has very strong bipartisan support and helps state and local governments promote economic development and job creation. Given the broad range of programs and activities funded by this bill, the subcommittee received and carefully considered thousands of member requests from more than 75 senators. The result is a thoughtfully crafted appropriations bill that is responsible for taxpayer dollars and responsive to critical needs. I would again like to thank Chairman Schatz and his staff for all their hard work in helping us get to this point, specifically the clerk, Dabney Haig, Rojat Mathur, Jessica Sun, Kelsey Daniels, and Amanda Krogenberg. Cronenberger, excuse me. I would also like to thank my team, the clerk, Mike Clark, Jason Woolwine, and Cam O'Brien, as well as the GPO staff who were instrumental in assisting our teams with this bill production. A special thanks to Daniel Ulmer and Kendall Moore for all their hard work 
and Katie Cooper and Dr. Bailey Archie. I would also like to thank several of the ones that we have not been mentioned that certainly put in a lot of hours. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting the fiscal year 2025 Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development and Related Agencies Appropriations Bill. Again, thank you, Chair Murray and Vice Chair Collins for convening today's markup and for your such conscious awareness of the time frame. Thank you. Senator Schatz, you have a manager's package. Madam Chair, the manager's package being distributed to each senator has been cleared on both sides, and I ask the committee to adopt the package by voice vote. Are there any objections? If not, stopped it with that. Um, with that. It is agreed to. Sorry. It's done. Um, are there any members who have an amendment who wish to speak to the bill? Senator. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have an amendment, which I, again, will withdraw, but I do want to highlight an issue that is hitting all of our states, and there is language in this bill that uh, addresses the August redistribution of the uh, transportation yeah. funds, and I've talked with uh, Chairman Schatz about this and, and also with uh, uh, Ranking Member Hyde-Smith. Uh, there is a Band-Aid fix in this bill for the August redistribution. This is when you have leftover dollars and they ask to redistribute the dollars quickly, and it's hard for our state DOTs to make the uh, adjustments. I've, I've, the U.S. DOT has had a very slow pace of getting the grant funding out the door of these, these smaller grant programs that were created in the IIJA. At a hearing last month, the FHWA administrator, uh, uh, Shailen Bott, said that he expects the amount of funds subject to August redistribution to continue to rise uh, of unused obligation authority. So there are several reasons. Um, there are too many new allocated programs with overlapping uh, eligibilities, and these programs face implementation challenges. Many of them have expanded grant eligibility to new recipients that are not used to applying for these funds, and they're not prepared to comply with federal requirements. U.S. DOT is taking way too long to execute project grant agreements with grant awards, often has the agency layered on requirements that are not in law. Um, additionally, the TIFIA program, which is the um, tax um, uh, incremental tax um, credit assistance, uh, that is getting less attention. Why is that? Because all the money is free now with all the grant programs. So neither additional staff at uh, USDOT or an appropriations bill can really fix these underlying causes of the August redistribution prob uh, problem. Several state DOTs have requested additional contract authority to help them absorb more of the unused obligation authority from the allocated programs. So I'm working on a bill that responds to those requests. Chairman Schott says we will work together to see if we can find a fix for this, but it certainly doesn't go, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not allowing our DOTs to do the best in terms of planning and using the uh, uh, existing resources to do the best by the states. So I withdraw my amendment, but I did want to highlight the issue for those of you unfamiliar. Thank you. Madam. Wish to be recognized. Senator Moran. Senator Murray, thank you. Uh, I'm in the uh, position of uh, speaking about an amendment that I was unsuccessful in including in the bill. But, you know, um, Senator Moran, could I just respond to uh, Senator Capito on absolutely. that topic first? I, I yield oh. to the senator from Hawaii. Thank senator you. Schatz. Um, just, just, I'll make it quick. I just, we had a conversation on the phone, and I just wanted everybody to know that I'm serious. I think this is a real issue, um, and I want to work on it um, with Senator Capito and others. Um, I will say that the a lot of your state uh, Department of Transportation directors um, do not like the kind of blunt force uh, solution that was being um, considered. And so I think we're going to have to work with the Association of uh, State Transportation Directors to find a solution. But you are absolutely right with all of these sort of new programs and projects uh, getting out that we are having some difficulty in actually deploying the resources that we appropriated. And that's that's not a, an imaginary problem. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Moran. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, this is a topic in which I drafted and had a, 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 an amendment drafted, but was unsuccessful under the onerous rules of you cannot appropriate, you cannot legislate on an appropriation bill. I was shocked to receive that answer. Um, <laughs> significantly disappointed and wanted to know what grudge somebody had against me. Um, but there's an issue that I'm going to continue to raise. It really is an authorizing issue, but I was trying to solve more quickly. And that is the mortgage insurance program at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. 
excludes critical access hospitals from being eligible by, I think, a, a technicality. And for most of us, uh, those are the hospitals that have the most difficulty in borrowing money to build a new facility. And mortgage insurance would be a significant opportunity to assist them in expanding their capabilities in infrastructure. And I raise this topic in this room because I can't imagine there's not a senator sitting around this table who has a significant presence, who doesn't have a significant presence of critical access hospitals uh, in their states. And I would welcome uh, uh, assistance and help uh, support from my colleagues to see if I can get something moving through the, the authorizing committee uh, of banking. So thank you, Chairman. Are there any other senators who wish to speak or offer an amendment? If not, uh, the bill is uh, agreed to and will be reported as amended. And with that, we will turn to the Senate Foreign Operations and Related Program Subcommittee. And I do really want to thank Senators Kuhn and Senator Graham and all of their staff for their work on this bill. At a moment that is really marked by conflict and urgent challenges across the globe, strong U.S. leadership could not be more important. That was why earlier this year I fought so hard alongside many here today on both sides of the aisle to make sure we finally passed a national security supplemental that supported our allies, strengthened our investments in the Indo-Pacific, and provided critical humanitarian aid to save lives caught in the middle of conflict. But these challenges and many others remain, and this bill reflects the need to maintain a strong U.S. presence. It includes investments that will make sure we continue leading on the world stage and keeping our country safe with every tool at our disposal. That means diplomacy and countering aggressive moves by the Chinese government. It means investing in global health and helping our partners stop health threats in their tracks before they pose a threat to our nation. It means investing in long-term U.S. and partner economic security and our partners' ability to defend their sovereignty and it means support for humanitarian aid, disaster response, and international organizations that help prevent conflict and chaos. These are crucial investments now more than ever. So I really appreciate this committee's work on this. Senator Coons, I will turn it over to you. And thank you, Chair Murray and Vice Chair Collins, for your leadership of this committee. Uh, I am so pleased to bring uh, to us the State and Foreign Operations Bill for Markup. Uh, it is, for FY25, a $61.6 billion bill. And I want to begin by thanking my ranking member, Senator Graham, and his very capable staff, Paul Grove, Adam Uzerski, Catherine Bowles, for their partnership in producing this genuinely bipartisan bill. I also want to begin by thanking my clerk, Alex Carnes, and his talented team, Kali Farman, Sarita Venka, and Drew Platt. Uh, we do genuinely work well together. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, the General Publishing Office and Congressional Budget Office staff who play a critical role role for all of us in getting our bills ready in time. Now, a brief word about this bill. We received input from more than 80 senators and hundreds of groups representing NGOs, faith organizations, diaspora communities, businesses. All of this country seems interested and concerned on how this committee advances U.S. foreign policy and values in this bill. Uh, Senator Graham and I and our staff work closely together to take all these views into account and to write a genuinely bipartisan bill. There is plenty we can and should agree on. We agree it's important we strengthen efforts to confront security threats from malign state and non-state actors. We agree on the importance of maintaining a strong economy to withstand global shocks and unfair trade practices. We agree we need to employ a diplomatic and development workforce that enables our government and our businesses to compete. This bill advances these objectives and more. It increased funds for critical partners. It provides more support for Ukraine. It provides support in the Indo-Pacific, in fact, $1.9 billion for Indo-Pacific partners. It increased investments, as was referenced before, to counter the flow of fentanyl from 125 to 170 million. It enhances economic and digital security to blunt the spread of economic coercion by the PRC. That's 685 million. Given the lateness of the hour, let me um, summarize. This bill, this bill meets our commitments to international organizations and financial institutions. It ensures we're at the table when critical issues are debated. It strengthens our efforts to sustain and advance development by focusing on localization, evaluation, and partnership. The outcome of any negotiation results in aspects that neither Senator Graham nor I would have drafted if we alone were in charge. That is the essence 
of bipartisanship, but this compromise, when enacted, will make the United States and our partners stronger, more secure, and more resilient. It's the first step in a long process. I look forward to working with members of this committee and with your leadership, Madam Chair, as we advance towards conference. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Graham. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, really enjoy working with Senator Coons and his staff. Uh, he's named them all. The absence of criticism is praise enough where I come from. So they all really do a good job. Uh, this bill has to be viewed in light of the times in which we live. Sec uh, uh, Director Ray said, wherever he looks, there's blinking lights. Now, the last time we heard that was before 9-11. The Iran report that was a year late about their malign activities and their nuclear program is now available to the Senate. You need to read it. What they're up to is very dangerous. The facilities we have overseas are very much threatened by Iran initiatives in the region. Iran has contacted people to kill members of uh, the Trump administration to uh, get back for Soleimani. China is a threat, but Iran is on the prowl. To the State Department, you serve in some of the most dangerous places in the world. Some of you come from State Department families. Nobody here wants to send our soldiers into battle without the best equipment, the best intel, the best everything. Our State Department is in some of the most dangerous places where there really is no military to come over the hill. This $61 billion appropriations is 1% of the budget. To the people who want to just get rid of state foreign ops, foreign aid, then you better buy more bullets because if we don't stay engaged in the world, we're going to pay a heavy price. The border is broken, but that's not the only threat we, play, uh, we face. There's $3.3 billion in here to help our friends in Israel who are under siege everywhere. There's money to continue the fight against AIDS. How far we've come in the last 40 years. Do you really want to stop now? Malaria, TB. Why do we invest in these things? Helping others is a good thing, and it does pay benefits when the people that you're helping will have a more favorable view towards you as a nation. And quite frankly, America needs all the friends we can get. We have enough enemies. I want to stay involved in this account as long as I'm in the Senate. I'm a pretty hawkish guy, but this account protects America as much as any battalion on the battlefield. And the people working in this space are heroes. They're at risk. You need to read this report on Iran. There's always ways to save money. And there's always cheap shots to take in politics. This account is where the rubber meets the road. And if we don't protect our people in harm's way, when an embassy is attacked and people are killed, the response is, what the hell happened? Well, I can tell you what happened. If you continue to deplete this account, there's going to be more likely an attack, not less. To my friends in the House, you've cut this account by $10 billion. Really? And most of you who cut this account are pretty hawkish on the military side. It makes no sense. So I want to keep working with Senator Coons and everybody on this committee to tell our constituents this 1% of the federal budget is used to protect those who are in harm's way representing our interest in faraway places. It's used to help people save lives. If you're pro-life, this is really a good count. There have been a lot of people, a lot of mother-to-child age submission is, transmission is way down because of what we've done uh, in the pet far uh, space. And we extend pet far for a year in this bill. So count me in for having a strong military. Count me in for having strong soft power. Senator Coons, you have a manager's package. Madam Chair, I have a manager's package. I would like to offer an amendment. This manager's package has been distributed to every senator, and the provisions, I understand, have been cleared on both sides. This package of amendments improves the bill, and I ask the committee adopt this package by voice vote. Are there any objections? 
Without objections, the manager's package is agreed to. For the uh, information of all senators, here is how I'm going to proceed. Um, we're, we're going to do three amendments. Uh, the first one will be Vice Chair Collins' amendment on UNRWA. The second one is Chair Kuhn's amendment on UNRWA. And then Senator Shaheen will offer her amendment on family planning, which is the same funding increase as we adopted by amendment uh, last year. So without any objection, I will move in that order. And I do plan to offer an amendment for the purposes of discussion, but I will not be asking for a vote okay. on it. Senator Collins. Thank you, Madam Chair. On behalf of Senator Graham and myself, I do have an amendment that I am offering that would simply extend the current prohibition against funding for UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, for the remainder of the fiscal year. It would otherwise expire in March of 2025. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to hear from the elected leader of Israel. In the prime minister's address, he described once again the horrific attacks of October 7th, during which Hamas terrorists murdered parents in front of their children, women were raped, hostages were taken, and babies were burned alive. In the aftermath of that terrible terrorist assault, the United States has come to Israel's aid, providing assistance through both an emergency supplemental as well as our annual appropriations bills. As part of our legislative response to support our closest ally in the Middle East, and to the revelations that Hamas and other extremists infiltrated the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, the Senate on multiple occasions passed funding restrictions on UNRWA. The fiscal year 2024 Consolidated Appropriations Act includes a funding prohibition for any fiscal year 2025 funds or pending funds from previous fiscal years through March 25th of 2025. And again, all my amendment does is simply extend the current prohibition through the remainder of this fiscal year. As recently as this month, Israel provided a list of 108 UNRWA staff who have been identified as members of Hamas or the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and many more employees have been identified as having family members involved with Hamas. Second, an independent review of UNRWA in April, which was conducted by a former foreign minister of France, found serious neutrality violations, including anti-Semitic educational materials used in UNRWA schools that teach hate and incite violence. Third, UNRWA's Gaza headquarters sat right on top of a vast complex of computer servers that were the intelligence and communication center for Hamas. This hub ran on electricity from the United Nations power supply above it. It defies belief that UNRWA staff was unaware of this huge power drain. My colleagues, it simply would be irresponsible to allow our taxpayer dollars to fund this organization in light of what we have discovered and continue to discover about UNRWA. Now, let me be clear that this amendment is not about whether we should be providing humanitarian assistance to the people of Gaza. We have been doing that through, uh, despite this funding restriction on UNRWA. There are other agencies, some of which we plussed up last year. I have supported and continue to support such assistance. What this amendment is about is simply whether U.S. taxpayer assistance 
should be provided to an organization with links to a terrorist organization, to Hamas and the Islamic Jihad that have attacked our ally Israel. And, I might add, are holding hostages that include American citizens. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Senator Coons. Do you want to start? Ma Madam Chair. Sen Senator Coons. Um, if I might speak to, uh, to the amendment, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I respect uh, the concerns raised by Senator Collins. I think it's important that we all put this in the context of where we are. It was just four months ago in the supplemental uh, that we agreed to prohibit funding to UNRWA through March of 2025. Uh, there are a wide range of very strong views about UNRWA. Uh, I think we all recognize um, that UNRWA um, continues to face very troubling allegations about it and its connection to Hamas. Um, the government of Israel also continues to allow them to operate because the reality is that the humanitarian situation, not just in Gaza, but also in Jordan, in Lebanon, in the West Bank, would become untenable without UNRWA's network. Um, so uh, in my view, um, we know that the House SFOPS bill carries a prohibition. We will have this debate in conference. Um, I recognize that part of my role here is to represent the views of my colleagues, um, many of whom believe that UNRWA uh, is being falsely accused and undermined and that they can and should play a role in providing for humanitarian relief and support in other geographies like Jordan. Um, and others would like us to work this through in conference. So, um, and I also want to thank uh, those of my colleagues who are forbearing on other amendments that might have um, risked bringing down this bill altogether. It is my intention to vote no on Senator Collins' amendment and to offer a side-by-side -side uh, that will be different by just a few months in terms of the duration of the prohibition. It continues it until March. It only allows any funding in the, for, in the future if there are several key gates met uh, that include consultation with Israel uh, and implementation of policies and procedures to fully vet uh, anyone who continues with UNRWA. Uh, let me conclude with a brief comment, if I might. Uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Graham, um, as well as Senator Cardin and many others, have worked tirelessly to try and make possible a different future uh, for Gaza, for Israel, and for the region by reconciling Saudi Arabia and Israel. Um, we know that this prohibition in any event will be fully in place through at least March of next year and will likely extend beyond that. I hope we will recognize that we don't today know what the circumstances will be on the ground with regards to Israel and Gaza. And I think all of us hope that we will see uh, a ceasefire, a hostage return, and a path forward towards regional security. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Um, we will go back and forth, sure. Senator Graham. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will be... Uh... Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah there you go. Uh, I will be joining Senator Collins here. You know, I tried to express just a few minutes ago, I really believe in this account, <clears throat> but one thing I believe in is not throwing good money after bad. Uh, the jury is in for me with UNRWA. They're dead to me. We've learned enough for me to never give these people another penny until they're completely changed. How much more do we need to know before we conclude this is a bad investment? Not only do we have 12 UNRWA employees on tape participating in the attack against Israel, there's all kind of evidence that may be up to 1,400 people associated with Islamic Jihad and Hamas. UNRWA is a UN agency that employs people on the ground. Well, the people they're employing on the ground are really radicalized. I mean, how did October 7th happen to begin with? When you teach your children math by saying if you had 10 Jews and you kill six, how many would you have left? That has to stop. There's just a mountain of evidence that this organization's been the problem, not the solution. And one thing about UNRWA, did anybody not notice the power bill kept going up? Literally. <laughs> there are tunnels under the headquarters hooked up to the power cable, running servers, weapons cache, 
and I'm supposed to believe you didn't know? Have you heard anything below lately? This is ridiculous. So the house says no money all the way through September. I want to marry up with the house to give this bill some chance of passing. And I want to make a statement here about what I'm against. I'm against organizations that have been corrupted. This organization is corrupt to its core. And there will be a bipartisan vote here today that will echo what I'm saying. And let me say this about the Palestinian people. I hope and wish you a better life. That's going to come only after Hamas is destroyed. And it will come from people in the region, not the American taxpayer. It will come when the school systems change. De-radicalization and demilitarization, I think, are non-negotiable for Israel and me. I say this without animosity toward the Palestinian people because I can only imagine what it's like to live with a bunch of terrorists every day, all day, for all of your life. I hope that will be over soon. But to the United Nations, you're making a guy like me's jobs impossible to keep this crap up. You need to look in the mirror at the United Nations and say, what did we let happen? And if you're not willing to end it, we will end it for you. So I respect Chris Coons as much as anybody in this body. I will respectfully vote against your alternative. Now's the time to send a clear signal to the United Nations. Clean your act up. Senator Madam Van Chair. Hauer. Senator Van Hollen. Thank you. Um, I, I wish my colleagues, I don't know if Senator Graham or Senator Collins is, have talked to Scott Anderson. Uh, have you talked to him ever, either of you? Scott Anderson is a 20-year U.S. Army vet. He's from Iowa. He is UNRWA's point person on the ground in Gaza. And anybody who suggests that Scott Anderson has anything to do with Hamas needs to apologize to him. I'm not suggesting that's what you are doing. But I would encourage all of you to talk to him. He's a... He, he, He's a just army vet guy. He believes in the United States. He also believes in human rights. He's UNRWA's point person in Gaza. Now look, anybody involved in the Hamas attacks on Israel needs to be held accountable and pay the consequences. And the allegations have been, I believe up to now, that there were 19 members of UNRWA uh, who were alleged to have been involved. And there's an ongoing investigation into that. But UNRWA in Gaza alone has 13,000 employees. So yes, punish anybody, whether it's 19, less, or more involved in Gaza. But the fact is UNRWA, with Scott Anderson, US Army Vets Oversight, is the one that's been providing humanitarian assistance in Gaza. And by the way, Ambassador Satterfield, who was our humanitarian coordinator, we asked him monthly about allegations that UNRWA provided humanitarian assistance had been diverted to Hamas. And he not only said he had no evidence during the time he was there of that, but the Israeli government had not brought him any examples of it. Maybe other entities involved in distribution of aid in Gaza were responsible for diversion of Hamas, but not UNRWA. This is according to David Satterfield, a well-respected ambassador. So this is why the other countries, all of our other allies, who also froze their contributions to UNRWA when those allegations were made, have decided to restore their contributions to UNRWA. Australia, Austria, Canada, Estonia, Finland, Germany, Iceland, Italy, Japan, Latvia, Lithuania, the Netherlands, Romania, Sweden, UK, EU. Are my colleagues suggesting all of them are complicit with UNRWA in support of Hamas? That's nonsense. I encourage all my colleagues here to also go look at the US intelligence report about the allegations of further Hamas infiltration of UNRWA. Go see it. It's in the intelligence committee room. It's been there for months. They do not hold up to the comments and allegations 
that you're all making. And now I would also ask my colleagues, you, you know, your, your amendment doesn't only apply to UNRWA operations in Gaza, the humanitarian operation. It implies to Jordan, too. I know the King, King Abdullah has talked to many of our colleagues. There are lots of schools in Jordan that receive UNRWA support. I haven't heard a single allegation about textbooks or anything that was going wrong in Jordan. And yet, if you talk to King Abdullah and you look at what's happening in Jordan now, a close partner and ally, there's a huge amount of instability. He has been really asking repeatedly this body not to cut off UNRWA support for students in Jordan. UNRWA provides for some schooling. It also provides for health clinics. And so what this amendment does is say, even, even though our close partner King Abdullah says that this is going to destabilize the situation in Jordan. There have been no allegations with respect to any of UNRWA's operations in Jordan. We're going to cut them off, too. Look, this has been a, a goal of um, Netanyahu's for a very long time, long before the war in Gaza. Uh, he didn't like the idea that, doesn't like the idea that a UN entity was set up to address Palestinian refugees. So that's been a goal of the Israeli right for a long time, even though many in the Israeli military, as Senator Coons mentioned, recognize the importance of for stability for UNRWA. So uh, this is um, an amendment that, unfortunately, is not based in the facts uh, with respect to many of the claims that were made. I will emphasize again, anybody involved in the horrific Hamas attacks should be prosecuted and held accountable. But let's not punish 2 million Palestinians in Gaza who have nothing to do with Hamas and an organization that includes over 13,000 just in Gaza alone on the horrific actions uh, committed uh, by a few. And so I would urge rejection of this amendment. Uh, Senator Graham. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, to my friend, I want to work to get Saudi and Israel to normalize, and part of the deal would be a better future for the Palestinians. That's the only way you're going to defeat Hamas. I mean, I, I get all that. How many of you on this side have been told about UN UNRWA for years? Everybody. All of us have been told. It's not a right-wing thing. Most people in the conservative side of Israel, uh, Minister Gallant, have been warning us about UNRWA, and I keep supporting the account up until now. <clears throat> whatever oversight we have, Senator Van Hollen, fail miserably. <laughs> Under the headquarters, there are weapons caches, computer systems, and housing for Hamas commanders. Under the headquarters. So I would say whoever's involved in monitoring how UNRWA works, you failed. I had nothing against these people individually, but how much more evidence do we need to have before we say UNRWA is not a good deal for the American taxpayer? It's not a good deal for stability in the region. And I am just insistent that this organization on our side of the aisle is dead because of their actions, not because of false accusations. It's because of the people we have on tape. It's because of the family members we know associated through intelligence, not coming from BB, but coming from Assad. So I know how this vote's going to end, but I have no apologies to anybody for saying UNRWA should be defunded until it is fundamentally changed. Senator Merkley. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I associate my, my position with all the comments that uh, Senator Von Holland uh, has, has put forward, and I so appreciate his intense immersion in, in this issue. I want to add uh, this. Not only has everyone associated with Hamas been immediately expelled from UNRWA, uh, but an intensive effort has been underway to uh, make sure that anyone else who might be associated is, is, is removed. 
And uh, yes, Hamas has put facilities under everywhere that they thought they could get a, away with it, and very difficult uh, under schools, under hospitals, and so forth. But here's the thing. The vast majority of the UNRWA workers are risking their lives every day trying to negotiate the bombings, trying to deal with the outages of, of internet and, and telecom to try to get essential humanitarian supplies to a population in dire need. They are doing this at great risk of their own lives. 168 employees of Gaza have died in this, of UNRWA, have died in this, this Gazan battle. Uh, there is no alternative for others to be able to organize them to do make these deliveries, to provide these services. We have an area of the world that is on the brink of famine. We have mothers who are unable to get to a hospital to deliver a child because of the lack of transportation and the, the uh, lack of communications. We have the fact that uh, uh, we, children are having their limbs amputated uh, without anesthesia. And those mothers, uh, many have experiencing uh, miscarriages because of lack of nutrition. And when they deliver, are unable to breastfeed their children for lack of, uh, of their own nutrition and the lack of uh, food supplies. It's, it's the UNRWA workers risking their lives every day to address these dire, dire circumstances. To undo the ability of UNRWA, the workers who are faithfully executing their humanitarian responsibilities, is to increase the deaths from malnutrition, increase the deaths and from miscarriages and stillbirths and children dying after they're being born for lack of, of nutrition to increase all of the challenges that the aid workers, the international aid workers who work with one nonprofit of other has said this is the worst condition to be found in the entire of the world. Worse than Somalia, Somalia, worse than Sudan, worse than the front line of, of Ukraine, the worst in the world. So to all those UNRWA workers who are risking their lives every day to provide fundamental supplies in dire circumstances, we should not undermine them in this fashion. Madam Chair. Senator Collins. Madam Chair, given that the Senator, my friend from Maryland, suggested that I misled the committee, gave inaccurate information, I feel compelled to respond. First of all, I've spent a great deal of time looking at the facts of this situation with the UNRWA. And it was a report, the Kalana report, that was performed not by me, not by the United States, but by a former foreign minister of France that found widespread violations of neutrality by UNRWA and particularly singled out what Senator Graham has talked about in the educational materials. Second, as a result of an agreement uh, that, the, that the ranking member on the House side, Rosa DeLora, and I worked out to compensate for defunding UNRWA. We did not, contrary to the implications of the comments I've just heard, take away humanitarian assistance. We, we put it in agencies that we could trust that were not infiltrated by Hamas, specifically we put the funding in the Migration and Refugee Assistance Program and the International Disaster Assistance Program. Senator Coons was involved in this as well. So the implication that if we stop funding, and, and we've already stopped funding, this is just an extension of the prohibition. The implication that that cuts off needed assistance is just not true 
because of the agreement that I reached with Democratic members in the House and Senator Coons to plus up the funding in these two accounts. And I would hope that as we debate this issue, that we could stick to the facts. I realize that there are disagreements that are totally legitimate, but let's not misrepresent what was done. Um, Madam Chair, uh, yeah, I would, I would encourage all my colleagues to read the Kelowna report. Um, they uh, dismissed some of the claims that people have made with respect to UNRWA. They did find uh, that UNRWA required serious reforms in certain areas, something many of us have been pushing for uh, for many years. Uh, and UNRWA has undertaken and accepted every single one of the recommendations made by that report. And so I agree all of us as a committee, Republicans and Democrats, should work together uh, to make sure that UNRWA follows through uh, on the accountability measures identified in that report. But I, I do want to say that that report um, did not uh, accept many of the other allegations uh, with respect uh, to UNRWA. And again, I would encourage my colleagues uh, with the respect to the, the claim, and I'm not suggesting either uh, senators of the senators here today made it, but essentially if you listen to people like Prime Minister Netanyahu and others in that government, they're saying that UNRWA is a, a proxy of Hamas, which is just patently false. And again, go talk to Scott Anderson. The guy who's in charge of UNRWA, Gaza, is a 20-year army vet. I really... I hope all of you will go talk to him and, and put these questions to him and put these questions directly to other folks in UNRWA and listen to their responses. I, I would also point out once again that um, with respect to Jordan, um, none of the assertions that are being made today with respect to Gaza, nobody's made any of these claims with respect to Jordan, and yet this does cut off funding for UNRWA in, in Jordan. And, and the final point I will make is I was glad we collectively provided uh, one-time sizable amounts of humanitarian assistance uh, to people in Gaza and elsewhere around the world. But uh, that was one-time funding. This has been an ongoing effort. And the, the good news is all our allies who also initially decided to uh, stop funding UNRWA, they've, they've looked at the facts. They're not pro-Hamas. They don't want to sanction anybody who had anything to do with Hamas. But everybody from Germany to once more recently UK and all the other countries that I mentioned, for the reason Senator Merkley mentioned, with respect to humanitarian assistance in Gaza, they're supporting. Uh, they decide to restore their, their, their funds. So again, I would, I would urge my colleagues to work together on making sure UNRWA implements as it says it will uh, the recommendations in that report, but not to defund them. There are several senators I know have requested to be recognized. Senator Shaheen, do you still want to come? And Senator Murphy, I want to make sure you both have a chance to speak. I just want to make sure I understand the, the situation. Is it the intent of um, Senator Collins and Senator Graham to um, not provide funding for or UNRWA in Jordan, even though that has not been implicated in any of the concerns with respect to the October 7th attacks? Well, first of all, we increased the funding for Jordan above the memorandum of understanding in this bill. So there is additional funding for Jordan in this bill. So would it not be affected then by your amendment? Can the chair and ranking if, member if, explain if that If I may, me? yeah, I'm not gonna give a dime to UNRWA anywhere. <laughs> if we missed the Tuttles in, in, in Gaza, what are we missing somewhere else? I'm, I think I'm probably one of the biggest advocates for Jordan on the committee. I'm always arguing with Chris to give him more money. What you're not getting here is that they, I don't care what they do in Germany. They didn't do anything they want to. I like Germany. I was stationed there four years. I am done with this. I mean, it is hard in the environment where so many problems at home talking about helping others. Well, you know what? We need to help others. I don't mind helping the Palestinians, but 
how can you say that it is a good investment by the American people to give a penny to this group when they're on tape, 12, 30, 40, who, who knows, actually participating in the attack? I've seen the literature they produce. Does anybody doubt the statement that under the headquarters in Gaza, there was weapons caches, housing for Hamas, and computer servers hooked up to the UN power supply? So no money for UNRWA anywhere, period. Okay, I'm still confused, though, because... I understand what Money you're for saying. Jordan, yes, no, none for Hamas. I understand what you're saying, but when you say money for Jordan, is the ability of that funding able to do the same humanitarian effort that UNRWA could do in Jordan? And why is the king so concerned about it if that's the case? Because they've got serious, serious Yeah, we, they have they're taking the burden of refugees. I hope people, it's good discussion, but Jordan's really helpful. I mean, Syria's breaking down. They're surrounded, man. And the king of Jordan, he's a good investment, not perfect. So, yeah, but we're, we're helping Jordan more, not less, Senator Shaheen. But I can't stress enough that the UNRWA infrastructure to me is tainted. And well, just... Just to That's be clear, you're saying yes, and Senator Coons is saying no. Okay. If right. I can, Senator what Coons, I think, what I'm trying to answer your question, um, if Vice Chair Collins' prohibition passes, does that prevent funding going to UNRWA in Jordan, as well as the West Bank, as well as Gaza, as well as Lebanon? Yes, it prevent my understanding, yeah. not to characterize someone else's. But I think Senator Graham was quite clear and forceful. Yeah, oh, no, I mean it to be. If it doesn't, I want it to. <laughs> However, really however, there is this. additional money going to the kingdom of Jordan, which they can choose to distribute to That's people true. in need within Jordan, but it cannot go to fund UNRWA's operations. It doesn't go through UNRWA, right. but it goes through these other programs, and it is higher than our agreement calls for with Jordan. Senator Murphy. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Listen, I, I agree with Senator Van Hollen's characterization. I do think that the connection between UNRWA and Hamas is, has been, at times, dangerously overhyped. But I do just want to speak to the practical reality here. Um, everyone that I have talked to operating on the ground in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Jordan, tells me that overnight you cannot flip a switch and transfer over all of the humanitarian relief, all of the educational programming, all of the medical services, all of the nutrition services that UNRWA does today, by far the largest provider, to new organizations that may be funded under this bill. That is just the practical reality. The other practical reality is that right now, Lebanon is in free fall. There is potential disintegration happening in Lebanon in the next 12 months. The King of Jordan is here telling us, keep UNRWA alive because the stress of flows of Palestinian refugees and additional Syrian refugees and the potential bottoming out of social services because you can't replace it all in the next six months if we continue to defund UNRWA is potentially catastrophic. So part of the reason I'm so worried about this amendment is because, well, I understand the intent, take UNRWA out of the business of providing these services and put somebody else in charge, I, I think is belied by reality in terms of how the actual on the ground provision of aid works and the consequences of erasing these services, maybe in the short term, is potentially that Hamas and other terrorist groups gain additional foothold because they're the only ones that can provide the services in the absence of an interim provider and the potential continued political and social unraveling in very fragile places, Lebanon uh, and Jordan uh, in particular. So I, I think this provision is directly contrary to our interests in the region, trying to hold very fragile places together. I, I, I have not heard from providers on the ground, nor political Madam leadership Chair. in those countries that 
you have the ability to replace those services immediately, and that's why I would respectfully oppose this amendment. Senator Hogan. Ma Madam Chair, I, I think this amendment is really important. I think it's really important that it pass. If, I think if you want a bipartisan, cer certainly if you want support uh, from our side of the aisle, I, I think we're going to have to continue to ensure that uh, UNRWA does not uh, get these funds. And so, I, I mean, I think you've got to look at it in that larger context. Now, if somebody's worried about Jordan not getting uh, funding or some ally that should get funding, that's something that can be worked on. Uh, but I think it's very important that we uh, continue. And, and, and again, this is a continuation of what's in place. By not having there, that changes it. And, and the way we approach these things is that, you know, we continue what we've agreed to have in place, not to make changes. And this would change it. Uh, S Senator Collins, and then I will turn to Senator Coons for final comments. So we will go to a vote on this amendment. Madam Chair, I just wanted to reemphasize the point that Senator Hoven just made. This is not new policy. This has been in effect during the previous administration for a period of time. So this is not the switch has been turned off, to use your phrase, Senator Murphy, um, previously, and other agencies have picked up the job uh, that were not corrupted by Hamas. Um, in addition, this has been in effect since March. And so there has been transition time. Current law already extends it through March of next year. But again, in the previous administration, there was a funding prohibition for UNRWA. So other agencies, including there's a broader UN refugee agency, as you know, um, that has capabilities, the American Red Cross, uh, the two associations that I already mentioned that I worked with um, with Congresswoman DeLauro on the International Dis Disaster Assistance Fund, the migrant and, um, and refugee account. Uh, so there are other ways. I'm not trying to halt humanitarian assistance. I'm trying to halt the funding of an organization that is infiltrated by Hamas. And it wasn't I who discovered that the Hamas headquarters were underneath the, uh, UNRWA. The New York Times broke that story. The, it, there are numerous confirmations of what has happened. Thank you. Thank you. We will turn to Senator Coons for final remarks for the information of all senators. We will vote on, the, on the, this amendment at the conclusion of his remarks. Uh, I'm intending to vote against Senator Collins' amendment and then to offer a side-by-side -side which is closely related. Um, it would continue uh, the prohibition on uh, U.S. taxpayer funding to UNRWA through March of 2025 and then say only if, and then there's a whole series of conditions. Uh, only if there's a review by an independent entity of UNRWA's implementation of its oversight, only if there's a complete and thorough vetting of all active UNRWA personnel in consultation with the government of Israel, only if there's an investigation of any derogatory information and action taken, and it includes saying funds should be made available to build the capacity of other implementers other than UNRWA um, for United States humanitarian aid. So that's the Alternative amendment I'll offer immediately following uh, a vote on this amendment by Senator Collins. And I appreciate the passion, the intensity, and the engagement of all my colleagues on this important humanitarian issue. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Senator has requested a vote on this amendment. The Clerk will call the roll. Senator Durbin. No by proxy. No by proxy. Senator Reed. No by proxy. No by proxy. Senator Tester. Aye by proxy. Aye by proxy. Senator Shaheen. No. Senator Merkley? No. Senator Coons? No. Senator Schatz? No. Senator Baldwin? No. Senator Murphy? No. Senator Manchin? Aye by proxy. Aye by proxy. Senator Van Hollen? No. Senator Heinrich? No. Senator Peters? No. Senator Sinema? Aye. Senator Collins? Aye. Senator McConnell? Aye by proxy. 
Senator Murkowski. Aye. By proxy. Senator Graham. Aye. Senator Moran. Aye. Senator Hoven. Aye. Senator Bozeman. Aye. Senator Capito. Aye. By proxy. Senator Kennedy. Aye. By proxy. Senator Hyde Smith. Aye. By proxy. Senator Haggerty. Aye. By proxy. Senator Britt. Aye. By proxy. Senator Rubio. Aye. By proxy. Senator Fisher. Aye. By proxy. And Senator Murray. No. On this amendment, there are 17 ayes, 12 nays. The amendment is agreed to. Senator Coons, you're recognized to offer an amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. As I previously spoke to, I offer an amendment entitled Prohibition on Funding for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency uh, that preserves the current prohibition through March of 25, 2025, and only permits any future funding after a whole series of conditions and accountability measures I have just described um, are um, undertaken. It requires a certification by the president that those certifications have uh, been completed. I ask for a roll call vote. Uh, question, question on the uh, amendment. How does that affect the amendment that was just passed? Both amendments. Maybe, and maybe uh, the Here sponsors of the amendment uh, of the uh, Sorry. Collins uh, Graham amendment could. How would this amendment? offered by Senator Coons affect the amendment we just passed. So what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to be very honest with everybody. Um, the UN needs to reevaluate what happened here. Why would you say if this, if that? No, the case is closed right now for me. I am trying to send a signal to the United Nations and other organizations, don't ever let this happen again. I'm not ever going to give a penny to UNRWA until you convince me that everybody that was in charge is fired. Uh, to the people, uh, you know, I like Dave said, if it was your job to manage UNRWA, you failed. What are we doing here? We're trying to keep open a line to an organization that's completely tainted. Uh, Senator Shaheen, I admire you greatly. I don't mind helping people. I want to give money to other organizations who I don't think will build tunnels under, under the headquarters, you know, be, be complicit with this attack. UNRWA has blood on his hands. They're part of the problem, not the solution. I have no desire, zero desire to help UNRWA. You can't convince me they've changed. Nothing's changed that I know of and no ifs, ands, or buts about UNRWA. This to me would be a mistake, Senator Coons, to say there's no accountability in Washington. There's going to be some accountability here. So I want to make sure we don't give a dime to this organization anytime soon. Is there any other senator wishing to If I can just answer the question. My expectation is no matter what happens here today, the prohibition on funding of UNRWA remains. And this is a conferenceable item because there will be some small difference between the House and Senate versions of the prohibition. So... The difference is, does it go to March? Does it go to the next September? That amendment's already passed. Mine includes some language about future accountability and transparency measures, and includes a provision saying that where possible and as appropriate, funds made available should be used to build the capacity of other implementers of United States humanitarian assistance. So there's a slight difference in language that would be subject to conference. To answer the Senator's question, both amendments would be, be in the final bill should this amendment pass. Are there any senators who wish to speak to this amendment? If not, the senators requested a roll call vote. The clerk will call the roll. Senator Durbin. Aye by proxy. Senator Reed. Aye by proxy. Senator Tester. Aye by proxy. Senator Shaheen. Aye. Senator Merkley. Aye. Senator Coons. Aye. Senator Schatz. Senator Baldwin. Aye. Senator Murphy. Aye. Senator Manchin. Aye by proxy. I by proxy. Senator Van Hollen. Aye. Senator Heinrich. Aye. Senator Peters. Aye. Senator Sinema. Aye. Senator Collins. No. Senator McConnell. No by proxy. Senator Murkowski. No by proxy. Senator Graham. No. Senator Moran. No by proxy. Senator Hoven. No. Senator Bozeman. No. Senator Capito. No by proxy. Senator Kennedy. No by proxy. 
Senator Hyde-Smith. No, by proxy. Senator Kennedy. No, by proxy. Uh, sorry, that was Senator Haggerty. <laughs> no, by proxy. Senator Britt. No, by proxy. Senator Rubio. No, by proxy. Senator Fisher. No, by proxy. And Senator Murray. Uh, aye. On this vote, there are 15 ayes, 14 nays. This amendment is agreed to. Senator Shaheen, I will recognize you for an amendment. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to call up my amendment to the State and Foreign Ops Bill to increase the bilateral family planning and the UN population fund accounts. Um, in last year's omnibus, first of all, this amendment um, was approved by this committee last year. But in last year's omnibus, despite our efforts to increase funding for family planning. Um, it was flat funding that came out of the negotiations. The important part about this funding is that it goes to support vulnerable women and families around the world. Um, and despite the importance of that, these accounts have not been increased in 12 years. Just 214 million women and girls don't have a choice about pregnancy. They lack access to family planning that gives them the agency to determine when to start a family. According to the Guttmacher Institute, an increase of just $10 million in U.S. international family planning assistance means an additional 561,000 women and couples can be served. That would avert 189,000 I'm going to say that again, 189,000 unintended pregnancies and result in 61,000 fewer unsafe abortions. By passing this amendment with the numbers that are proposed, we will reach 1.4 million additional women and couples. We will avert 472,500 unintended pregnancies and 152,500 unsafe abortions. Um, I think that's why it's all the more important that this committee support an increase for family planning. An increase in family planning doesn't just increase the quality of a woman's life, it greatly improves the lives surrounding her, leading to increased quality of life and reductions in maternal and child mortality. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, let me just urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on this amendment? Madam Chair. Uh, we have this debate pretty well over here. Um, bottom line is this account uh, being plussed up will create not only a problem with the House, but a lot of us over here. Um, I try to be accommodating Senator Coons the best I can to keep these things static. Increasing is just going to throw everything in a ditch still going to vote for the bill. I know the amendment will pass. I know how the, the outcome of this amendment will be. I understand politics for both sides. But to my colleagues here, um, this bill is very important. Let's make sure going forward um, we preserve it and make sure that we all can play base politics. We can, you can. I just really worry the times in which we live, we don't want to jeopardize this account because people serving overseas are under threat. You need to read the Iran report, what they're up to regarding our interest in the Mideast. We're living on borrowed time if we don't increase our security footprint. So with all due respect, Senator Sheen, I will uh, oppose this, understanding the consequence to the bill, but still support the bill, even if the amendment passes, uh, realizing it will not make it through the House. So. Any other senator wish to speak on this amendment? I, I would just like to offer a final comment because I, I appreciate what you're saying. But just as you were making the argument that facts should prevail when we're talking about UNRWA, facts should prevail when we're talking about women and their access to the ability to determine their own families. This is not about abortion. If you don't like abortion, you should support this amendment because it would avert 189,000 unintended pregnancies. There would be 61,000 fewer unsafe abortions. This is about protecting women and their children. And so I understand what you're saying, Senator Graham, but sadly, the debate around 
abortion has morphed into a debate around a whole lot of other issues that affect um, women and families. And this bill is an effort to try and ensure that the poorest women with the least opportunities have access to the same health care for their families that others have in the developing world, developed world. So I, I hope people will support this. Thank you. The senators requested a roll call vote. Clerk, call roll. Senator Durbin. Aye by proxy. Aye by proxy. Senator Reed. Aye, Aye by proxy. Senator Tester. Aye by proxy. Senator Shaheen. Aye. Senator Merkley. Aye. Senator Kuhn. Aye. Senator Schatz. Aye. Senator Baldwin. Aye. Senator Murphy. Aye. Senator Manchin. No by proxy. Senator Van Hollen. Aye. Senator Heinrich. Aye. Senator Peters. Aye. Senator Cinema. Aye. Senator Collins. Aye. Senator McConnell. No by proxy. Senator Murkowski. Aye by proxy. Senator Graham. No. Senator Moran. No by proxy. Senator Hoven. No by proxy. Senator Bozeman. No by proxy. Senator Kaplan. No by proxy. Senator Kennedy. No by proxy. Senator Heitzman. No by proxy. Senator Haggerty. No by proxy. Senator Britt. No by proxy. Senator Rubio. No by proxy. Senator Fisher. No by proxy. And Senator Murray. Aye. The, the amendment is 16 ayes, 13 nays. The amendment is agreed to. Are there any other amendments that members wish to offer? Senator Van Hollen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I, I will just read this uh, amendment to my colleagues. I, I'm not going to call for a, a vote on it. But uh, I heard Senator Graham uh, say that uh, he wanted normalization of relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. So do I. Uh, he also, I think, recognizes that Saudi Arabia has made clear uh, that if we want to have long-term peace and stability in the region, uh, we're also going to have to allow self-determination for all the Palestinians who have nothing to do um, with Hamas. I, I just met with them last week, and that's exactly what he said. We need to move in the direction of a two-state solution. Um, I know you, Senator Graham, have said that in, in the past. I, I don't know if that's still your view, but what's happening right now on the West Bank as the war in Gaza goes on is shutting the door every day on the possibility of a two-state uh, solution. And that's because you've got these very right-wing extremist elements in the current Netanyahu government who are seizing this moment to expand outposts, illegal under Israeli law, expand settlements, and have been complicit in settler violence. And I do just want to briefly quote um, the, the major general, the Israeli major general, the head of the IDF uh, in the West Bank, uh, his name is General Fuchs, uh, he just stepped down, uh, and he warned about exactly this happening uh, on uh, the West Bank, uh, the rising settler violence, uh, and essentially indicating that the political forces within the Netanyahu government uh, were allowing this to continue um, even though it undermined Israel's own security interests. Uh, so I, I hope our colleagues will look at this. You've got people like Smotrich, uh, who says things like there's no such, such thing as a Palestinian. He called for the elimination of uh, Hawara, a Palestinian village, um, last year. Uh, this is the guy who's in charge, uh, and the settler violence is dis destabilizing the West Bank in a big way, not only according to the Israeli general who just was responsible for this area, but, but our own General Femzel, and I would encourage all of our colleagues to meet with him. He's a three-star. He's the head of the USCC there. So um, I, I hope there's an agreement. I'm not going to push for a vote today that no U.S. dollars should be complicit in any of these activities uh, that uh, promote extremist settler violence or the expansion of settlements, and I hope we can have that conversation. I will say now, um, Madam Chair, and I, I regret to say it because I thank your, you for your leadership and the Vice Chair and both the Chair of the Subcommittee Ranking Members, but I want to be recorded no on the final bill. The Senator has that right. He will be recorded no. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you both for your work on this. Um, I just want to mention two uh, amendments that I'm not asking for a roll call vote, but I hope um, uh, both majority and minority will take a look at as we 
move this process forward. First is um, an idea um, I think that's um, uh, that merits consideration. DoD has um, an unfunded priorities list. Um, it's a way for us to sort of hear what we're not funding, what what and the consequences of not funding really important projects to the Department of Defense. I think it'd be really important for state to have the same list so that we could sort of have a better understanding of the consequences of um, what we're not able to fund through our allocations. Um, I have an amendment to set that process in motion, and I hope that it's just something that um, the chair and vice chair will look at. Um, second, I have a, an amendment um, that would um, repeal um, the um, impact of the Jackson Vanek Amendment uh, on Central Asian states. This was an appropriations rider from 1974 that is uh, sort of, I think, very unfairly and detrimentally harming our relationship with Central Asian countries. Um, I think it's likely an appropriations issue. Finance has some concerns, and so we'll try to work through those concerns with them. Um, so um, look forward to talking to the full committee about both of those amendments. I'm, I'm going to join Senator Van Hollen in changing my vote to no um, on the underlying bill. Um, I appreciate that we still have a lot of work to do as this moves to conference to try to address both Republican current concerns and Democratic concerns about the way in which we provide humanitarian relief uh, inside Gaza and in the Middle East. But for today, I'll ask to be recorded as a no on the SFOPS bill on final passage. Senator has that right. He will be recorded no. Senator Merkley. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. I also wish to be recorded as a no on the SFOPS uh, bill. But I also wanted to mention the, an amendment uh, that uh, I will not ask for a vote on, and that is that we proceed under Merkley Amendment Number 1 to fund the Green Climate Fund. Uh, it is the situation that we have had more than a dozen instances already this year of a billion dollar weather events related to climate change. And we're seeing right now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 800,000 acres burning in Oregon, more than all the fires in New Mexico, Arizona, California, Washington State, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska combined. We are seeing massive disruptions that will only continue to get worse year after year. And all the Green Climate Fund says is that according to the, the commitment that we made in, in Paris in 2015, the more affluent nations are going to help the poor nations cope with some of the devastating effects of global climate change. We will not be able to tackle this issue by ourselves because the atmosphere is a global issue. For the world to tackle it, there has to be U.S. leadership. For U.S. leadership to be effective, there has to be the power of our example. And one simple and important piece of that is providing some funds to help the poorest nations cope with devastating consequences. I withdraw the amendment. Are there any other amendments? Or I would record the vote of Senator Merkley as no. Are there any other senators who wish to speak? Senator Moran. Chairman, sadly, sadly, I do want to speak, and I know that the vote's pending that I just cast for many of I you. I would only room. remind you that Senator Collins has not missed any votes, <laughs> and so I'm uh, just going to warn and you, you. And you will not, you'll make certain they don't close the vote until you both get there, I, I assume. Let me say quickly. I've not had a chance in this kind of setting to highlight something that we recently learned from the Department of Veterans Affairs and from OMB. A mandatory funding shortfall of approximately $3 billion in the compensation and pension and readjustment benefits accounts for fiscal year 24 and a discretionary funding shortfall of approximately $12 billion in its medical care accounts for fiscal year 25. VA, Department of Veterans Affairs, and OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, waited until after this committee passed its MILCON VA appropriations bill two weeks ago to come forward with this information. And only after this committee had acted on, on a bipartisan basis, a craft to, to craft a funding deal based on overall spending caps enact, enacted in the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and they are coming forward with an accurate budget to provide for our veterans nation's veterans. So only after we did our work are we informed of this problem. And it could not, in my view, have been only then did the VA or OMB know these facts. We've had the secretary, as the chairman of this committee would know, in front of our uh, Committee on Veterans Affairs. And the testimony from him and from the department officials is they have sufficient funds to implement the PACT Act. This uh, has 
We have an obligation to our veterans. There's no one in this room and no one in the Committee on Veterans Affairs that believes otherwise. But the VA claims now that 7 million veterans and survivors are at risk of not receiving their benefit payments on October the 1st, a date in which there's very few days in which we will be here between now and then if Congress does not act before September the 20th. Under the current congressional schedule, it's only those few weeks between now and September 20th. As I said, I think we're all committed, I'm committed to making sure veterans and survivors do not suffer. But I think this is significant financial mismanagement and or incompetence at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I'm gravely concerned that the administration, both the VA and OMB, specifically misled Congress for months about the state of affairs at the VA and the level of resources that are actually needed to care for veterans and their survivors. I just want to make certain that it's known this is um, unacceptable, and I hope to all of my colleagues, we have no choice but to address the issue, but we also not ought, to, ought not to leave unaddressed the issue of the ability of the Department of Veterans Affairs and OMB to tell us the truth in a timely manner. They need to be much more transparent and forthcoming. I'm the lead Republican on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. I hope that uh, Senator Tester and I will be able to host and hold a hearing with Secretary McDonough and other VA leaders about this mess in coming weeks. As we proceed with funding the government in fiscal year 25, we all have another issue that presumably you could have dealt with had you known when you made the decisions about emergency spending and whether it was domestic or um, defense. So I offer my condolences to the two of you, but the consequences are significant for many people and a lot more challenges for us as we try to do something in a fiscally responsible uh, manner and take care of the veterans who deserve the benefits that the PACT Act provides. Thank you. Thank are you for listening to me. Are there any other senators who wish to be recognized? If not, the final tally on this bill is 24 ayes, 5 nays, and the bill will be reported as amended. Uh, with, uh, with that, I just want to take a moment to really thank everyone for their participation in today's markup. It takes a lot of hard work to get here, and I'm pleased to say we have now marked up another four strong bipartisan bills, and we've shown that once again that it is possible to make progress in a serious bipartisan way when we bring solutions to the table and leave politics at the door and listen to what folks back at home are telling us about the programs and investments that make a difference in their lives. So I want to thank all of my colleagues, especially Vice Chair Collins, who worked very closely with me to produce these bills for the work that's made possible. I look forward to keeping up this progress in reporting strong bipartisan bills out of the committee with another markup that will be scheduled next Thursday morning where we, where we will consider the remaining five of our FY25 bills. And with that, this committee is adjourned. <laughs>